Hi, this is Joseph Arthur. Thanks for checking out Come to Where I'm From. Please support us on Patreon, patreon.com slash come to where I'm from. We are an independent podcast, and any contributions you can make are greatly appreciated. I was just saying, I was just saying that this is what what I use for vocals in my studio. I've got two of them, and they're really because they record everything very evenly and very flat, and there's not a lot of you know it doesn't fluctuate that much. Then when you do add an effect to it or whatever, it's very even. Mm. So. As an, yeah. as an amateur, I always have a problem with the gain on these. Bro, they always, yeah, they're very, anymore. it's very low. Yeah, you, you, got, always, yeah. you always have to crank yeah. it up. When yeah. I first used them, I was, I, I first used this on some, on David Berkeley outside in the middle <laughs> of the away. desert. You gotta, you and I was closer. shocked by how clean away. it was when we were yeah. outside. Right, right. Yeah. That sold me. Yeah. I knew nothing about yeah. these. Yeah, you're right. Okay. The gain is an issue on them because yeah. you do need to crank them up. But that's probably also why they record so evenly. Yeah, you know, they're not super hot. You know Joseph Arthur? He we got Bear Martin on the podcast. <laughs> he came here to eat breakfast. <laughs> can we can't. Hey, man, it's okay to eat, it's okay to eat and talk on, in podcasts is all your, at the same time. Is Especially your, when it's yogurt. I thought it was a scented candle. Oh, my God. Dude, this is the fancy... The fancy, the fancy <laughs> yogurt from, from uh, Citarella. Barrett Martin. Yeah, like the $8 one. We have right? the legend, the, the man, the myth, the legend. In my mind, it's Barrett K. Martin for some reason. Is K? A K? No? Uh, no, actually, it's an H. K for kick ass. So okay, okay. What number right. of podcasts is this? Uh, Let's uh, start it. 120. Hold on. Nine. We already started anyway. 129. Wow. Come to we, where I'm we, from. we need all that mic stuff in, in, sure, in the mix. Sure, I'll, I'll leave it in there. You better. They'll think it's the Ehud Lazen podcast because you're not in it for the first two minutes. Good. Let them think that. <laughs> it might evolve into that. Who knows, Who bro? Knows? Barrett Martin. Where did the name Barrett come from? I love that name. Uh, Well, in the Celtic, it means strength of the bear. Mm. Really? But if you go to the French... It means uh, a highway, like a highway man, a, a highway robber. So it really depends on which side of the English Channel you're on. That nails you perfectly. Uh-huh. You're both. You both have bear-like <laughs> strength, and you're a highway man. Well, we spent a lot and of time. And you're a thief from the spirit realm, bringing seeds of joy from the spirit realm into the material plane. I try my best. You do great. And also, we're in a band together. Let's just announce that. Let's just say that we're in a band with two other amazing dudes. Rich Robinson. And Peter Buck. And Peter Buck. And, yeah. and uh, we've been working on it now for... So, for technically, for, since 2019. Well, I got in. I'm the last member. I was... I was uh, the missing piece. I was the missing puzzle piece. But you guys, how, tell us how that this whole new project started. Well, the origin stories are always the best, mm-hmm. but uh, I met, okay, so I've known Peter since about 1994, I think, maybe 93, when he moved to Seattle to mix those two classic REM albums. Uh, How'd you meet him? He, his wife at the time owned the Crocodile Cafe. You know, we, right. you played there, right? Yeah, yeah. It's, it was like the greatest rock club in American, like it's at in, that time, you know. incredible, yeah. Still, it's still going. Yeah, still going. And so she introduced me to Peter because he needed somebody to play, uh, believe it or not, upright bass for to do some some acoustic gigs at the Crocodile. And I also play upright bass. Right. But then that has turned into, you know, a nearly 30 year friendship. And this album that you and I and Peter and Rich just did is the 30th album that That's Peter incredible. and I have played on, like backing up different, Crazy. I know 30 albums just That's with, amazing. just with Peter, you know, how many albums have you made total in your, well, you probably don't even know. I've made about a, I've played on about a hundred and uh, about 130. Wow. I was, yeah. And yeah. 30 with Peter and 30 of them with Peter. Yeah. And, um, so what was it like when you first met him? Were you nervous or were you just like, whatever, I'm cool with this? Well, I, was, I, I probably was a little bit nervous because I loved R.E.M. Mm-hmm. You know, when I was in college, you know, they were the band, you know, like most of the 1980s right. and well into the 1990s, obviously. And then and then at one point, Peter asked me to play in R.E.M. So I played on two R.E.M. albums, New Adventures and Hi-Fi, although everything I played on was a B-side, so it wasn't on the actual studio album. That's one of my favorites. It's of a great album. I, the, I love yeah. it. 
all the songs, even yeah. the B-sides were incredible. And then uh, and then on the Up album that came after that. So And New Adventures is long, too. Yeah. It's not a yeah. short album. It's yep. got like, I don't know how many songs. but And that album they did mostly at the sound checks for the Monster Tour. Right. So, um, but they also did studio stuff. And, and so I played on those two albums. And then In Peter... the studio with the whole band? Yeah, yeah. Well, let's see. When I did... Actually, when I played on the new adventure stuff, uh, I just went in as a percussionist by myself and the producer who at the time was Scott Litt and just did percussion overdubs on, on a bunch of stuff. And then on the Up album, it was the whole band together. But Up, wasn't Up the first album with uh, only the three members or was that the last album with the four members? It was, it was just with the three members because mm -hmm. Bill quit the band right. and I, I was there when he quit, but he was there in the beginning like... I'm not sure at what point he made his decision, but I was just was there when mm. when he announced it, you know, in the studio. So we had to kind of, there's a little bit of a um, scramble, I guess. We And so I played drums on some songs, and mm -hmm. Joey Warrenker, who had been playing with Beck, he played on some songs. Mm. And then I played, I mean, I played upright bass, I played vibes, I played keyboards, I, a lot of percussion. I just, whatever they wanted me to do, I played it. Yeah, you know? Barrett, for those that don't know, is really great at multiple instruments. But what would you say your primary instrument is, if you have even one? It's drums. It's drums, Yeah, it's right? drums. That's what I'm known for. That's yeah. what you're known for? Well, you're yeah. known for... You're known for a lot. I mean, like the cool vibe stuff in Queens of the Stone Age. Yeah. That's Barrett. Like, <laughs> I, I mean, like, so... You know, you're known for more than just drums, but he was the drummer in the Screaming Trees. That was like the first big gig, right? But yeah, that was like the second, second second band that I was really in. But it was the first one that had you know mainstream success. So, oh, okay, yeah. yeah. Which yep. which is with Mark Lanigan, who we've had on this yep. podcast, who's yeah, you know, everybody knows is a mystical, yeah, and amazing. And after all these Character. years, still, still our friend, St and still killing it. Yeah, like, actually, better, maybe better than ever. He escaped America, which is incredible. Yep, yep. I think he made a really good move with that <laughs> early on. I'm like you know, a he, little envious of that move he made because right when, right before L.A. just went completely, I don't, I don't even want to say it the wrong way, but you know, pear yeah. shaped or whatever you want to say, like completely, like end of the world ish. He got out right at the right time. Yeah, and he's he's always been an incredible singer. Like that's what he's yeah. known for. He's got that incredible yeah. voice. But as he's gotten older, you know, he's a really great writer. And uh, mm -hmm. I read that he's got a book of poetry coming out. I mean, he's really just like mm -hmm. expanded it all. You know. Yeah, he's a he's a mystic. Yeah, kind of well, shaman Eve or something or some kind of wild spirit with that guy. And you and I were talking about that all. All great musicians ultimately have to get into that realm anyway. Yeah. You have to get into the mystical, spiritual to like really yeah. open to what your your highest potential is. Yeah, well, like music, I feel like is like the language of mysticism in a way. Yep, it definitely communicates. Like synchronicities, like if you pay attention to synchronicities, songs will be really strong in that department. Yep. But real quick about Up, which is funny because okay. so, so Up, like so New Adventures was the first one, and but obviously you weren't thinking you were going to maybe be the drummer, the new drummer. No, I was but, just a side man, just, yeah. Right, but with Up, you must have had maybe some of those thoughts come through your mind, like, hey, I, this might become my gig. Did did that happen? Well, the what happened was we got into the studio and they the band just kind of said, well, we're going to use drum machines on some songs. They were kind of going right, that way. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, that, that process had already begun before, before you came, before in. I even came in. You, know? so you were coming so, into like a kind of a, a project already like heavily in motion. Yeah. Probably. And you know, the way they made their records, this is no secret. It's really kind of brilliant. They, they always do a, a demo session in Athens mm -hmm. with John Keane at his studio, which yeah. is their longtime friend. And they record all the demos, but then they then go into the studio and they often find that some of those demos are so good yeah. that they make, they end up being on the record. Right. So I was there to do the demos at John Keane's studio. Yeah. And then 
they I can't remember which songs which made it, but then used. we go went to San Francisco and did you know the big album production. Hey, do, so, you, do you know that yellow tambourine they have with the volume knob on it? I have not seen that. Oh, it was a, anyway. I have it because <laughs> when I, oh, was I like on, the volume uh, idea, like yeah, it's you know, just like, funny. Uh, dial it's, it down. If they're looking for it, it's at <laughs> my house <laughs> in New York. I got it honestly though because it was when Arthur Buck was on tour. Yeah. And we went through Athens and we did some rehearsing in there. Yeah, yeah. And then we brought the tambourine on to uh, to finish the tour. Right. And then it was accidentally in my stuff when it ended in my bag. I don't know how. I did not do it on purpose, but I plan on returning it. But I have REM's tambourine. So, um, before you get off, Harry, no, yeah, well, I wanted to talk about up still yeah. some more. Oh, go okay. ahead if you got a question. I just want the Bill story when he said he was going to quit. What oh, the yeah, me too. Like. Yeah, that's oh, good. We well, grazed upon that, but that's yeah, major. Yeah, no, that I mean, major, everybody, right. he'd already said that he was going to depart. I mean, everybody knew that. And then it was the just, aneurysm, basically, right? I, I don't think it had anything to do with it. He oh. was, he was completely fine and recovered and, uh-huh. and had been totally healthy for a few years you know because that happened when they were they were on tour and there had been a considerable amount of time so i I mean i have no idea why i i don't i'm not privy to any knowledge and he didn't say anything walked in and said guys i'm done well we were we were working at john Keane's studio and and it was just sort of like it was formally announced at that point and and at that point it was like okay we have you know Scott McCoy was was playing in the band because he'd been in the band for a few years at that point. I was there and um, and the other three members of the band. And so the decision was, well, I'll just play whatever needs to be played. So I, I, I ended up playing a lot of upright bass on that album because Mike Mills was playing keyboards, a lot of keyboards. And, and then I also played, you know, like marimba and vibraphone. And then there were a few songs where I played drums with a drum machine and they're sort of blended together. And a couple of songs where I played just straight drums. And, and then Jerry Warnker, who's also an amazing drummer, came in and played on some songs. And, right. and um, yeah, and it was just a really, um, really cool. I mean, I, I, I'm sure it was stressful for those guys because it's the first time that they made a record without their founding drummer. Yeah, it's but, a weird. It's a whole chemistry switch. Yeah, it changes everything. But yeah. that, but that record production-wise is really incredible. It's kind of like their Pet Sounds record, you know, just yeah. re- like it's got orchestration and really beautiful instrumentation and mm-hmm. and beautiful songs, you know, which they've yeah. o- they've always been great songwriters. So that's true. You know, it's funny about that album. Because Peter Gabriel, he had he uh, put out so yeah right? right right, and then after that he put out us so us and then and then his his you know and and Peter takes like you know huge amounts of time between each record so he had this triptych record concept that's like a million years long <laughs> right so right. us up. Up was going to be Peter Gabriel's neck. Oh, neck, it was, and it and it ended up being, but right like right before he was about to put out Up in the So Us Up thing, yeah, yeah. REM and um, he finds out that REM is going to call their next album Up. So they could literally put, oh, and then okay. so I think he reached out to them and said, "Hey, I got this So Us Up thing going on. It's been." <laughs> Right, so many years in the making. Right. Y'all think maybe you could figure out another title, <laughs> other, like because he's friendly with them, you know? Right, like, sure. What do you think about just rethinking calling your album up? <laughs> and I guess they didn't go for it. No, they did not. <laughs> they stuck to their guns, and so did Peter Gabriel. And wow, I never heard that story. Isn't that That's, funny? Yeah, That's a yeah. funny. It's it's true because yeah. then Peter Gabriel put out his album up. Yeah, so, he had to. It was so us up. Get it? So, like, us up. <laughs> <laughs> so that's pretty funny, though. Well, but back to the whole origin of this new band that we're oh, in. Right. What I think is cool, because there's the multiple things here. So mm-hmm. you and Peter have known each other, obviously, for years. Many, and many have, years, And yeah. you, you toured with R.E.M., I did, yeah. REM is kind of the seed of this I, thing because we all yeah. have some connection to REM in it's some true. way. Um, and then... Rich Robinson, the guitar player for the Black Crows. Well, Mr. Crow's Garden. That's right. Yeah. And they really 
I mean, I've just heard Rich talk about this. Yeah, they famously. really loved REM. And, and apparently the first rendition of the Black Crows was Mr. Crow's Garden sounded very REM-ish. I've never sure, heard it, but yeah. that's what I've heard. And then Rich and I met um, back in 2015. Well, t- actually, technically we met in about 1995 when the Screaming Trees opened a rather disastrous show for the Black Crows somewhere in Germany on a live television broadcast. And it's I, always I, in Germany. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah it always, <laughs> it's always Germany. And, What's wrong with you, Germany? All I can say is like the Screaming Trees played so badly that we, we left the stage early while it was still like being broadcast live on television. And we wow. barricaded ourselves in our dressing room while the German... I saw pro- a video about that. Yeah, it's on, it's on the internet. I no, think and, I see that. And, and Mark was like, didn't he like... He, fight somebody he, or like oh that's Ro- the- that was Roskild. <laughs> that was a few years earlier in uh, oh, at the okay. Roskild festival in denmark well, but what happened in germany what happened? It, it was just i don't i can't even it's multiple things but to the degree that we had to like flee barricade ourselves in our dressing room Mm -hmm. and then the black crows unfortunately had to like carry the rest of the show and i'm not sure how they did you'll we'll have to ask rich how that that's the first time i met rich so that was Mm -hmm. 95 then 20 years later he and i were asked to play this uh a show for jimmy page of led zeppelin and with jimmy page so rich and i played a bunch of led zeppelin songs Mm -hmm. and got to play with jimmy page and That's, that's high that's a high yeah, honor right there. And Jimmy Page did that whole tour with the Black Crows, where right. they where they did um, Led Zeppelin songs. So so we have this great kind of we have connections to REM and Zeppelin, and yeah. we all have worked together in some and, way. And Todos Santos, where me and Peter have like done. There's been those festivals that Peter's put on, right? It's a bunch of them, and and uh, um john paul jones always is showing up right and hanging out right. and we got to right. play with john paul jones so there yeah. is a zeppelin rem thing yeah yeah and actually our new project sounds like a cross between zeppelin and rem there's def- it has both of those qualities there's some, <laughs> it has some qualities yeah, of that yeah That's, and just great songwriting and it's yeah. got kind of the coolest what i what i hear is the best elements of the best of the the classic era of rock and great songwriting. Yeah. You know, there's stuff that sounds like Zeppelin, there's stuff that sounds like Bowie, there's stuff that sounds like yeah. like the best of the REM stuff and yeah, and some stuff that I can't even categorize it. Yeah, it's definitely a classic sound, but also it feels like it feels of this time. It it feels like uh we're in a lane that not that many people are occupying right now, and it's. I agree. It's, it's fun, man. What's it I, yeah. called? Uh, we're not going to well, say yet. Barry says okay. we're not. Okay. Because <clears throat> we're. Getting... I'm an oversharer, so <laughs> I would I would tell you, Poppy. But okay. Barry, I'm under strict orders <laughs> from. Fine. Now we're just from getting the bear hunter over there. <laughs> we're getting the... I can't. I can't say it. <laughs> we're getting the trademark. That's was, why. Uh, Page not available. It to was going to be called Mother Karma. I uh, can. Mother can I say sure, that? Yeah, like, because yeah. it's not going to be called that. It's anymore. not going to be called that. So. And I actually liked that name. And Luke Haynes came up with that name. Is that how you say his name? Luke Haynes, right? I, I don't Luke. know him, but I've heard you say his well, name. Well, he, he's he... plays in a band with Peter as well. Peter's oh, okay. in a band with lots of people. Okay. Like, like, <laughs> I still five. feel I still feel special, but <laughs> Peter's got lots of bands. Well, he's smart. He's diversified. He diversifies <laughs> his investments. That's it's, right. It is a good it is Yeah, his whole thing is just like I don't know, he's got a very I don't know, open approach towards making music. He's not overly precious and he's, he makes records in all kinds of different ways. Like some of them like really like loose and fast and then other ones more methodical and thought about. And I don't know, that's inspiring to me because mostly people go in one way or the other. They always do it the same sort of way. Right. And then the records all sound the same. Yeah. It's good to be, well, I mean, that's kind of the Zen of it, right? Is like whatever is required in the moment that you're doing it is what you do. Yeah. And sometimes like the up record was incredibly methodical. And that's yeah. why the production is so sophisticated and deep. Our record was done, you know, quickly, but over the course of a long period of time. But yeah. largely because we also were stopped by the pandemic. We just couldn't all get together. But what we were able to do is pretty remarkable and that's a lot of that is like technology allowing you to do things that you wouldn't normally be able to do right 
You mean like, yeah, by working remotely. And yeah, working like remotely and, and uh, people having home studios. And, and I, it's exciting to me. I like that. I yeah. like that because I work with people all over the world and I have done those very things. I work with uh, musicians in Brazil and they'll send me stuff. I'll do overdubs in my studio in Washington and send it back. Yeah. So Joe came in late. What did you guys do before Joe came? We did, all we did was just lay down some uh, uh, rhythm tracks, and um, it started with me recording their guitar parts in Nashville, in a hotel, in a room. hotel room. Like we How were did just, that happen? <clears throat> Rich, okay. So the, the the rest of the story was I was at the North Pole working with of course a, you were actual <laughs> north pole yeah yeah what's I, the address up there <clears throat> north pole i was i was 200 no, at the gay club down the street <laughs> I, don't, I don't know okay he was at the north pole on 14th street when somebody says <laughs> i was at the north pole it usually means at the bar they're called the oh north really it's pole. called the north pole no. No. there's got to be one <laughs> somewhere uh no i was about i was about 200 miles north of the arctic circle <laughs> recording as one is but I, I one of the things i do is i record indigenous tribes uh, on location in their village and help them make an album of their song their traditional songs their, their stories whatever you know whatever they want to put mm -hmm. out and then it and then they have that album it's just a gift they can do whatever they want to How do with you get it started doing that uh when i went to graduate school I, I started doing field projects which was part of my kind of like alan lomax a little bit like that yeah, and Incredible. I even went to some of the same places Alan Lomax did in the Delta. In the so Mid you're a field recorder, too, by trade almost. I was or, trained how to do that, yeah. That's incredible yeah. because this project came out of you basically, essentially field recording a couple of rock stars. In a, in a hotel room. Indigenous, yeah. like going <laughs> yeah. to their indigenous space, yeah. Like, yeah. which is like a Nashville hotel room. Yeah, Nashville's like, <laughs> like an indigenous center yeah. of some that's of the greatest funny. music ever made in this country. That's so that, true. Like Nashville all the way down to New Orleans and the Delta. It's oh, all like man, the New greatest Orleans. music this country has ever produced. Some of it. And and a lot from Seattle and a lot from New York. And we all you know, we all benefit from all Look at you, man. Everything I'm, that happened is everything's in, coming together for me with you right now. <laughs> this whole thing, this whole like you being a field recorder, your history with like Jack and Dino yep, in Seattle, yep, in the yep. Seattle sound, and then this thing with it. Peter, but uh, and Rich, but go ahead. So you're in the north. So, I, so I'm, I'm working with the Gwich'in tribe who live in. They're they're an Athabascan tribe that live the Gwich'in tribe. The Gwich'in uh, and they're Ath the Gwich'in tribe. That's their name, the Gwich'in. And what are, uh, they're Athabascan. They're related to the Navajo in okay. the southwest, but these are the ones that live in the Arctic, and they live in the Alaskan Arctic Wildlife Refuge, and and also in Canada. And so they wanted to make an album of their. Oh, I don't want okay. to. Like, I, yeah. I, but like, so what are they, what are they about? Like, what do they do? Like, how do they survive? They've, what's that? What's the, what are they like? They're caribou hunters mostly, uh -huh. but they also you know there's incredible salmon runs. You know, like the Yukon River goes through there, so like some of the greatest salmon runs in the world are right there. Uh -huh. So it's mostly caribou and salmon. Wow. And they're and they're connected to the Inuit people that live on the Arctic coastline that are more like uh seal and whale hunters but okay. but further inland you know it's more the the caribou so and when you go there yeah and you're hanging with them are you like living like how where do they live like what what is their what is their home docile or what is yeah yeah their, domicile, <clears throat> what their is? home village is i can't pronounce it in guichin i, I don't can't speak it but it's uh it's called arctic village and they live in uh cabins and when i was so i've been not igloos no no that that's all <laughs> i'm just like i'm just like putting one and one together to me it's a bunch of people no, no, in no. igloos like it could to be totally different environments yeah, so different cabins yeah and, and i in. i stayed in a tent on the tundra i just was in a tent wow you know and, and how uh, long are you there for well i've been up there twice now each time for almost two weeks wow, okay. so and so i just live with them and they wanted to record their elders stories because you know the, the elders are in their 80s and some of them are in their 90s they, were, and they, they want to document they, it they want to preserve so i recorded heritage. 18 hours of storytelling and uh in their language in english but some of it is in guichin okay yeah 
the dialect Gwich'in. And How then, amazing are their stories? Incredible, because it's all about what it was like living there when they literally traveled by a dog sled. And this is the best part. Their wow. music is built around violin. Uh-huh. And the violin came with fur trappers from mostly Ireland and Scotland in the like 18th or 19th century, so 1800s. And they have these stories about how there was one violin and they would share it between the villages and they would put it, they'd have a dance party and then they put the violin on the dog sled and send it to the next village so they could have a dance party. Wow. Yeah. Like that's That's, how, that's how powerful, that's incredible. That's how powerful one violin was, Yeah, you know, up there. Right. And they also had their traditional songs too. So they were doing a mixture of traditional and violin and they dance and they just, Mm -hmm. they totally get down when they dance. It's It's, it's almost, it's it's as if they're like passing the spirit of music uh, in this, yeah. in this, in this one object, yeah. and on a, and traveling by dog sled, the spirit of music is yeah. coming now to your village. Yeah, it almost makes it more sacred and and better that it's they don't just have tons of those. Right. I, I mean, it reminds me like when I was a kid, you know, and one guy in the neighborhood had a guitar, and everybody right. wanted to play that one. Like we didn't have guitars back then. Not <laughs> yeah. not the way you couldn't just order a guitar on Amazon. You know, yeah. it was like somebody had a guitar. Right. So anyway, I get a phone call from Rich on my cell phone, which I couldn't access for like two weeks until right. I got, because there's no reception up there. I finally got back to Seattle and he was like, hey man, I, I really love playing with you at that Zeppelin thing. Do you want to maybe, you know, I'm thinking about forming a band. Do you want to, you want to be a part of it? And I was like, heck yeah. Right. And so then that, those conversations became the beginning. And then it just worked out that we all ended up in Nashville at the same time. So, so we could, I could record them writing the first songs of our new band. See, that's that's like, yeah, because like when Rich Robinson calls and says, "Hey, you want to be in a band?" It's like, yeah, of course you want to. Like, he's yeah. like, I'm such a fan of the Black Crows and oh, the, another the way he plays yeah. and Chris and the way Chris sings. Dude, yeah, Chris, like that, he kind of loomed over me a little bit as a spirit while I was doing the vocals because I was like, you know, I'm a fan of those guys. Yeah. Me too. You know, so yeah. it's kind of like going like, oh, you know. What's cool about him is like having worked on now 30 albums with Peter, mm-hmm. most of which were in a studio, right? Yeah. Peter is one of the most consistent guitar players of any guitar player. Right. Like he's known for writing all those REM hits. Yeah. But, it, but just as a player, he's totally solid. Yeah. You know, he absolutely. doesn't make a lot of mistakes. No. He just plays it. And what's cool about Rich is Rich has this really, again, a totally spiritual cat. Yeah. Gets these inspirational ideas, channels it in, into his instrument. Yeah. It's the same way you write poetry. You, yeah. you do the same thing. Yeah. And so it, it's just interesting to observe. It's cool to be in it, but also observe it, you know. Like mm-hmm. whatever, but where people get their their talent. So, so you get the message. You, you're back, and then you get the message from Rich. And then, how long t- from that message till you um, and Peter and Rich were in Nashville doing that? And how did Peter come into it? I got well, that call was right around the summer solstice of 2019. So June by September we we're in Nashville. Uh-huh. So I went. I made a plan to go out there, but Rich asked me if I knew of any other guitar players because he kind of wanted to do kind of an acoustic thing. Right. And I said the best acoustic guitar player I know is Peter Buck, mm-hmm. and Peter was going to be in Athens, Georgia. Mm-hmm. So, so it was a short so flight. Close, yeah. So we just picked a, a weekend when we were all going to be in Nashville. And Peter was up for it as well. Totally, yeah, yeah. yeah. And then those guys started writing the song. Well, you all three, all three of you started writing the songs because there's Barrett songs, there's Rich songs, and there's Peter songs. Yeah, but what's cool about it is everybody had initial ideas and then the other guys like bounce it and it becomes this cool new thing. Yeah, they all sound of a... Of a thing. Of like, a thing. They don't, they don't know. It's not like, oh, what's this left turn? There's a few slight left turns, but not really. Yeah. It's all, uh, it's all pretty cohesive. Yeah. So how, how long were you recording in the Nashville hotel room? I mean, it was like three days that were like half days. Cause of course, you know, we all wanted to eat. Yeah. <laughs> and we were like, well, where should we go to lunch? Where should we go to dinner? So we kind of timed it where it would be between lunch and dinner. Mm-hmm. So I don't know. We didn't spend more than three or four hours a day recording. And I just set up just a couple of microphones and, and a laptop and a little portable recording setup and recorded them 
you know, playing their acoustic guitars. Yeah, you went to Guitar Center and bought like a <laughs> I did, yeah. Because I got there and I didn't really, I didn't, I didn't know if we were going into a studio to record or if there would be, and it turns out there really wasn't a setup. And I said, I, I think they were going to maybe record on iPhones and just like have demos. And I was like, hold on, right. I'm going to run to Guitar Center, buy a, a little portable rig. And I just set it up and, and did it. That's super easy. That's yeah. the field recorder in you yeah. coming out. Well, yeah. that would have been like, yeah, it would have been, it would have never happened if they put it on iPhones. No, probably not. I MacGyvered it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank God you MacGyvered it. Because now the album exists because of you. But wait, I mean, then how did he get the call? Okay, so we sat on the songs for a long, long time, time and we didn't really know. We were kind of just trying to find somebody that would be a good that would just get it, you know? And so I had a studio session with Peter working on this Delta Blues soundtrack that I'm still working on about, still you know, you a song on that. that's right. I need your vocal. And the track. <laughs> yeah. But there's, uh, that's a whole other thing. I've done a lot of work in the Delta with, with a couple of old, uh, old blues musicians that are from that original generation of like BB King and Muddy Waters and, and they're all gone now. They've all passed away. But we have a lot of film footage and recordings of, of these uh, shows we did together and, and studio sessions. So Peter and I worked on that. And I just said to him, like, Peter, who, who are we going to get to help us finish this thing? And he's like, why don't we just ask Joe Arthur? Like, he'll knock it out of the park. And I was like, uh, and, and I knew who I knew who he was because, you know, I, I remember when your first record came out and that you were the first, you know, like North American artist signed to Real World. Mm-hmm. And as a world music, ethnomusicology yeah. student, I'd been buying all of those records yeah. from Africa and South America and like really. Yusu and Dur. And, oh, yeah. yeah. Yusu Ayub. and. Yeah. And, and lots of stuff that was, you know, like not as well known, but incredible music that Peter Gabriel was curating. And so I knew and I heard that record. And so I knew who he was, but. You know, we'd never met. We'd never worked together. So, although we had met at, met, the, cro- at yeah, the Crocodile. Right, we met at yeah, the Crocodile. Yeah. I remember you, you stood up, you looked me in the eyes, shook my hand, said, thank you for coming. Right. But we didn't really have a conversation, but I remember yeah. you doing that. Yeah. yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah. That was nice of you to come. It was a great show. Thanks, man. Yeah. Yeah. So, I, and then I just started, uh, it was a good time for me because... I was going through a lot, you know, but like in good, good and bad, but like, you know, just life. And then, and it was during the pandemic as well. And I just had this, like this project that was fantastic to work on, you know, the great songs. And I did it all with, in that Brian Eno method, which is just the, I, something I learned from Brian Eno, which is like, do not listen to anything until you're, re- until you're already recording with the microphone on. So every melody was done off of instinct re- responding to the first time I heard it. Yep. And and a large part of those all were exactly where it went. It then it, it kept developing. Sure. And as it would develop, then I would like the phonetic sounds would start to form a few little words which then I would get an idea for a concept for the rest of the lyrics. But most of them I think I wrote like, you know, I didn't spend more than a day on any of them really it was just like and i did them all in a way that was just like even if i was like even if i wasn't totally in love with a lyric or a line i would just go with it because i was kind of going for speed as much as anything but that ended up working out really well because things i was judging as being inferior in the process have later become like things I love like, right you know this sort of vulnerability to it or something I don't know what it is but and and I don't think that would always work sometimes lazy writing is just lazy writing and I'm not even <laughs> I, and I don't think this is lazy writing it was just I was getting out of my own way during it I wasn't right. being too precious right. at right. all but I, you know I was trying but I wasn't being I wasn't trying too hard and I think that really works yeah. in this project I think it was just a chemistry thing well, you and I were, I've never met Brian Eno, but you, you were 
fortunate that he was one of him and Peter Gabriel were two of your first mentor and influencers. Yeah. And I've heard the Eno approach before, which is like, go with your spontaneous gut instinct. Yeah. It's kind of true about everything in life, really. I think so. But, but creatively, I found that to be true too. Like, like when I'm writing, I just kind of let it come whatever the inspiration is, I just let it flow, record it. Yeah. And sometimes it's kind of messy, but within that you can hear the idea emerge and then mm-hmm. you just kind of polish it. But when we were in the studio, you and I were talking about the way the universe kind of communicates all the time. And mm-hmm. I, I was mentioning John Cage, right? The, who's kind of like a precursor to Brian Eno, but uh-huh. you know, really in the early 20th century, because yeah. he had that same idea that the music is always communicating with you. Yeah. It's always trying to reach you. You just yeah. have to look for where is it? So like John Cage would buy old sheet music that was you know printed on like a, yeah. a printing press. He'd look for the watermark and and splotches in the paper and connect it and make notation and that would be the song emerging out of the paper yeah you know like that's just another example of it or like when when i was in graduate school working on my master's in ethnomusicology my field assignment was in the peruvian amazon with the shipibo which is another indigenous group and they get all of their songs from the rainforest they say the rainforest is constantly communicating through the plants and the animals and the birds, and they listen and they get these melodic ideas, but it also comes, it has lyrical information too. That's wild. And so they, and they use that as a way to heal. Like that's their healing modality is through these sacred songs that come from the rainforest and tell them how to heal. That's, that's incredible. And, and so it's all over the world. You just have to pay attention to it. And you know what's funny is it's like because I've like I've talked about synchronicity in the universe uh, communicating, and I had one like sort of cynical friend one time said, "You know that's a sign of psychosis when you think things are communicating with you." And, but you describing that what that tribe's doing? What's the tribe called? They're called the Shipibo, and they're in the, the, up, the upper Peruvian Amazon. Upper Peruvian yeah. Amazon. Like, yeah. Like that's just what you just described. It's like incredibly beautiful and like oh, the yeah. opposite yeah. of psychosis <laughs> no but no like, uh, yeah. in western world like we're, <clears throat> right. ta- we're taught anything sort of mystical or anything right of that thing was like, like that's like uh woo woo or right or, right or 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 signs of mental illness if you or you're you you know you must be a little bit deranged it's right. funny because i just found that that picture of of uh sleep cupid is sleeping oh that's beautiful i like that in in the in uh in the, it was leaning on a trash can Really? That was somebody threw it out. Somebody threw that out. And so I wow. grabbed it and was in Williamsburg and I'm walking to the train to come here and I like see this big, huge m- mural of Muhammad Ali. Right? One of my all time heroes. And so yeah. I, I, I want to take a picture of the mural of Muhammad Ali's, but so I put Cupid is sleeping leaning against Muhammad Ali. And when I go back to look at the picture, there's an arrow in the mural of Muhammad Ali right over his chest, right over that picture. Just like right. stuff like that, where it's right. like right. Cupid, the arrow in the heart. And, and uh, there's a lot of personal stuff going on that, that commu- is communicating a lot of stuff to me. Yeah. yeah. Like, and, you know, and to me, it's like, I love living in a magical universe where the universe <laughs> is like speaking to me. And it, and, and it can exactly. happen in the rainforest yeah. in Peru, but it can also happen in Williamsburg, Brooklyn. That's exactly be- right. Because we're all here on the, in, right. in this world, you know? Yep. Yeah, the universe is communicating all the time. And maybe because we're musicians, we pay attention to that. You know, yeah. like, like music is the invisible art form, right? You right. can't really see it, yeah. but yet it affects you deeply when you hear it and you feel it. Yeah. And like just one more example of this with the Shipibo, they hear the songs coming from the rainforest. They uh-huh. sing a cappella. You know, they don't have musical instruments. It's right. this a cappella, incredible polyphonic singing. And then they. They also see the song as a as a visual pattern. It kind of looks like a fractal, mm-hmm. and they weave it into their clothing, so they wear their music. It's a woven song, seen, heard, and sung. You know, it's a it's a it's How a. How did full, you discover them? Uh, a synchronistic event. I was getting ready to work on my, you know, my. Well, I was already in graduate school and I was working on my thesis project and I got invited by a totally separate group of people that weren't involved in the university, but it was an academic assignment. Right. So my my, uh, committee, the professors on my committee said, that's a perfect project. Go do it. So (sighs) it just all happened like that. Wild, man. But but like like, um, well. 
Muhammad Ali, there's a great example. Because you and I were talking about growing up in the 70s. Uh-huh. That was my hero, man. Yeah. Muhammad Ali. Yeah. He was just like athletically and like his intellectually his, intellectually and his poetry and like kind of hip hop rap yeah like, yeah rap or like two in a way. and and so like that affected me heavily as a kid and then when i became a drummer i i always thought like man i kind of want to play drums the way muhammad ali boxed you know which is mm-hmm. like light and da- like a dancing kind of feel you but then it so but then super drums, heavy dude. when it's you, time to like <laughs> lay in the the knockout you know like what did peter say about you as you're drumming is you're a mix between john bonham and and who max roach and max roach also it's, one of my favorite your drummers your feel yeah. is really really fantastic oh thank you yeah. but it's a, but but the illustration is like i'm inspired by a, a boxer yeah you know exactly and, and the great jazz drummers you know right. like that, that to me that's music muhammad yeah. ali boxing and dancing is music you yeah know? that's cool how'd you start playing drums oh listen i was like i don't know seven or eight years old and my dad bought me a little it was a little uh snare drum mm-hmm. And then the second part of it was a drum I mean, it wasn't much of a drum set. It was a kick drum and a tom-tom that he got at a garage sale. Mm-hmm. I remember because it cost $65 right. for the whole thing. <laughs> mm-hmm. And we set it up in the hayloft of the barn because I grew up on like a small farm. In, in Oregon. In right? Washington. In Washington. Yeah, rural right. Washington. And I just started playing drums in the hayloft and right. then i then i had a little phonograph in the hayloft, in the hayloft literally <laughs> in the hayloft and then i had a little phonograph uh-huh and uh and i had like my grandparents 78 jazz records so mm-hmm. i'd like listen to those and i also i had this aunt that was uh, about 10 or 12 years older than me and she was like the rock and roll aunt mm-hmm. that everybody should have you know yeah. or uncle Dude. and she, she gave me my first rock records which and of course it was like let it bleed the rolling stones that's incredible tommy the who um goodbye yellow brick road oh, and God. and there and, and there was a there was a thank her totally <laughs> so like that my aunt gave me my first musical instrument really that's funny but what was it was, it? It what was a sequential me? circuits analog synthesizer yeah. that i could compose it had a sequencer yeah on it i could compose I wish everybody had a rock and roll aunt. I had a rock and roll aunt. Yeah. yeah. Why They're did your awesome. da- dad buy the drum kit? My dad had played drums when he was in. Uh, okay, in he so got a scholarship got to college as a drummer, but he never played professionally. He just, but he loved drums. So and you we, bought that for him. And then you well, he played it out. as much as I did. Where is he at now? Uh, th- back in Olympia, where I grew up, Olympia, are you, are you, Washington. Are you still connected to yeah, him? Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. I mean, he's quite elderly now, but yeah, right. totally. That's in cool. fact, he came... My my wife and I brought him to my new recording studio because he he never really understood how you make a record. Mm. And on, of course, he never saw the old reel to reel tape machines that we used to use. But I showed him using you know Pro Tools and on my computer. And I played a drum beat, recorded it, and then I went and I played something on the piano, recorded that, played an upright bass, and I was like, "See, I just that's a song. Like that's how we do it. Mm-hmm. It's just mo- takes longer when you're making an album." You know? mm. But he it was the first time he really got it and then so when did you from there how, how did you arrive being like in the screaming trees say like or like where where's what was your path like to becoming a, a musician in a band and using that as like a career and everything i never thought it would be a career but i always knew i'd play music i just thought maybe it would just be a hobby or something but right. what happened was i i went to school originally to study jazz and classical music like college or something yeah yeah just i, I had a, <laughs> where'd like, you go just a small state college where i got a scholarship oh, okay. you know so I, c- I couldn't afford it unless i had a scholarship so i had a small scholarship yeah i went for two years i took all the theory classes and all that stuff and and, and a bunch of other classes too and i liked it but it I really felt like I needed to play and get experience playing. So I mm-hmm. dropped out and it was many years later that I went back and, you know, went, finished my undergrad and my, my, uh, master's degree. But, but for 15 years, all I did was play music mm-hmm. and I, and I still do obviously, but, but what I did was I, um, I started playing auditioning for bands in Seattle and I ended up getting in this band called Skin Yard, which was one of the with, pro- Jack, with Jack, Jack, Jack and Dino. Jack and Dino. And Shout out Jack and Dino. And when I when I met Jack, he had just recorded the first Nirvana record, Bleach. Bleach. Like had just done it. It's one of my favorites. Yeah, it's one of the classic records of all time. Mm-hmm. 
And so we, he already had the band Skinyard. I think they'd made two albums at that point. Matt Cameron from Soundgarden was the original drummer. Really? And so, yeah. And then, and then I joined the band and we Crazy. made two more albums, which did well, like, uh, you know, like on college radio. They were independent albums released by um sst records was this like early 90s or late 80s. it was like well late i think it was 1990 and 91 oh, okay. it was like those two years and we toured all over the u.s and canada we we did a european tour we opened some shows for nirvana right and really? then yeah early yeah. nirvana shows. yeah like we we opened for them in vienna i remember Before the, never mind then it was that. right when Nevermind came oh. out and they they were still playing shows in europe and they didn't the maxwell <laughs> Yeah, right, exactly. Wasn't massive yeah. yet, yeah. just about to be. Yeah, it had just come out and nobody knew mm. that it was going to blow up like that. Right. And uh, and then Skinyard came back from that European tour and Jack was like, you know, I don't really want to keep touring. I want to just produce. Mm -hmm. So Jack's kind of my first mentor like in production and, and how to be in a band. You know, like mm -hmm. being in a band is an art form. Right, but you know? Jack also showed you you can be a producer and in a band. And in a band, you can do yeah, both. Yeah, that's and wild. you learn a lot being in a band because you learn about um, you learn about diplomacy and equanimity and how to like. You what know. do those words mean? <laughs> <laughs> Tell here, us. I'm here all day. <laughs> it would take all day. <laughs> Never heard of it. <laughs> anyway, keep going. But, but, you, but <laughs> no, but being in a band, man. Don't, don't know anything about that. Anyway, being keep, being <laughs> in a band is a college education in itself because you learn everything about yeah. people's personalities Human and nature. how to do business, how to travel, how and to navigate. Everyone's messed up. Yeah, but uh, but also <laughs> In a good way. how to like help people get through that. Yeah, music is healing, man. You know, yeah, like it's it, true. it just does. It does this thing to architecture you. Architecture of healing. Yeah. So anyway, so Jack said, I, "I'm going to break up the band. I just I'm going to be a producer." And I'm like, "Well, I'm going to keep playing." And like mm -hmm. two weeks later, I got asked to audition for the Screaming Trees. And the night that I auditioned, they offered it to me. That's amazing. And we made the the first album I did with them was Sweet Oblivion, which we did here in New York. Uh. Really? Re recorded at a studio. That was their big breakthrough. That was the and breakthrough was like album. Five albums in. And you did yeah. it here in New York. Yeah, a studio called Baby Monsters on 14th and Chelsea District there. Wow. Uh, really cool vint old vintage studio. It wasn't very big. Why but did it you guys do it in New York? Because we just wanted to get the get New out. York vibe, man. Yeah. I, I was telling you this. What I like about New York, I, ha I have really great musical experiences here i've made records screaming trees did two albums out mm -hmm. here right i played a lot of shows out here with peter yeah and um and on our record yeah. it's a great place for creativity because everybody gets super focused yeah and you just lay it down it's There's a no focused place yeah for sure it's yeah. definitely like i love new orleans and stuff but when you're there it's like a little harder to focus yeah i've never <laughs> i've never I've made, made record, i've made records have? there yeah yeah, yeah. And they were focused, but it's just, yeah, there's just so much go Drinking going out energy. You worked, you did it at Daniel Lanois studio, no, right? No, I or? did it with Mike Napolitano. Oh, yeah. Shout okay. Out, right. Who texted me today. Like, a, it, that's not a na regular thing. He's like, sent me Sam Harris's meditation app. He's like, hey, bro, I'm getting, I like this. Try, check it out if you want to. Yeah. I'm like, cool. Thanks, man. But uh, yeah, he worked at Dan's studio. Right. So he came from that. Realm right. and right. he uh, had a studio across the street from Danny Daniel Lanois Studio, Kingsway. Kingsway, that's what it was. Yeah, <laughs> and it right. was, and uh, Mike's was called the Nappy Dugout. It was over because people call him Mike Nap Nappy. Right, his nickname Napolitano. Yeah. Right, Nappy. right, so, right. Uh, and that was right over Checkpoint Charlie's for for those New Orleans people, but. Um, so you guys did that, and then and it didn't Mark say to you that like, oh, I think we're gonna get dropped or something. Like oh that, yeah, you know? so so the, I joined the band and Lanigan. I had this old uh, warehouse space in Seattle, and the band came over and they're like, let's like write the album here, you know. So mm -hmm. they m moved all the equipment to my loft space, and we started writing the songs. They, some of them were already started, but we pretty much brought all the songs together there. And Lanigan said, now listen. <laughs> basically in his deep voice he's like look this is all cool and i really i love the way you play and everything but we're probably going to get dropped because <laughs> they were signed to epic you know so right. major, label. major label they'd made a record it didn't do very well and they right. you know back then if you didn't sell a whole bunch of records you got dropped yeah so. you, you'd have, i mean there were four albums you'd then. have to you'd have to sell right, like right. 
right. hundreds of thousands. Like you yeah, probably yeah. they probably sold fifty thousand or something like that. Or I who don't knows? think they not even that. Not even and they that? and the okay. previous albums had been also on SST records. So right. so they, they but they'd made one record for Epic and um, it's a great record. It just didn't sell very well. Mm-hmm. And Lanigan was like, We're probably gonna get dropped. So the A and R guy comes out from New York he, and he sits in on a rehearsal. We do like one day in the studio with Jack and Dino mm-hmm. just to like do demos. And he hears the songs and he's like, All right. Well, we're going to renew this and we're going to, I think they even upped the uh, recording advance so that we had enough money to make a proper record. And that's right when Seattle was going off. Like Nirvana was huge at that yeah. point. Yeah, Nirvana. Pearl Jam, yeah. Alice in Chains. You know, mostly, it was mostly Pearl Jam and Nirvana. Right. Those, uh, the, I mean, Soundgarden hadn't made made Super Unknown yet. Okay. Alice in Chains had not made Dirt yet. Those huge mm-hmm. records had not also been made. fourth or fifth album, Super Unknown. Not, right, exactly. Not right out yeah. the but, but for me, I mean, Soundgarden was my favorite band, mm-hmm. not just because from Seattle, but like that whole period of time, it was Soundgarden. Right, and they then, were the big ones. Yeah, yeah. And it was later that I became friends with them, but I loved their music. I just felt like that was the epitome of Seattle because it was heavy, but it was sophisticated. You know, like yeah. it wasn't a blunt instrument. It was very sophisticated. It was built around songwriting, but they could lay it down like a sledgehammer. And that's kind of my favorite kind of rock and roll like that. Yeah, well, it, well, that's a cool band name in that it's like, yeah. it's like soft. Yeah. Like yeah. Soundgarden. Like right. you, that could be a, that <laughs> right. could be a new age, like a new age band. Yeah. Soundgarden. But yeah. it's like, but you associate, now Soundgarden sounds like a hard name because of right. you associate. It's right. just a good example of how the name becomes, the band forms, the, the band whatever defines the name. Right, exactly. At a certain point, the mind switches and you just like, it's just that name, yeah. that band. So anyway, all of those bands were about to make their seminal records. Alice in Chains made Dirt. Screaming Trees made Sweet Oblivion. Soundgarden made Super Unknown. Nirvana made In Utero, which is also an incredible record. Some I, say it's even better. Well, that's my that <clears throat> maybe my favorite Nirvana yeah. record. I just yeah. love it. It's just I think they nailed it. It's an incredible record. Yeah. And at that point, Seattle was just like exploding, and and the Sweet Oblivion record sold I don't know three hundred fifty thousand, which was more a, like five hundred. I think it, now it's probably a gold record. It's taken some time to get there, but. Oh, I gotta tell them not to put the music. Oh, we got a little soundtrack going. <laughs> it's Leonard Cohen. Is it? Everybody knows that the dice is loaded. Everybody knows that the good guys lost. Yeah, that's the record. Everybody that's the record where he uses the, drum machine. Well, you know, I mean. It's got that Casio keyboard production. Yeah, exactly. Which I yeah. think in Leonard Cohen's case really like serves him because right. it frame it's like framing a masterpiece with like a really cheap frame. Right. But it's still right. a masterpiece. Still great. Yeah. And it somehow ex- it somehow uh, makes the song even more profound. Yeah. You know, I think I think that's why he would always do that. I think that's like on, on some purpose. level. Well, he did to do it on. I mean, he made many albums like that. With it's got that sort of Casio keyboard, and I'm not even trying to diss. It just does right. sound yeah. like a, it sounds yeah. like a fancy Casio keyboard kind right. of thing, like right. vibe, you know. And it's like he could have had, and you know, he could have, and because that album he made with Phil Spector doesn't really quite. It's kind of a. It's Which kind one of, is that one? Uh, Death of a Lady's Man. Oh, right, and of that's course. With Phil yeah. Spector, yeah. And, and, right. and he really right. didn't like that. I guess he had issues with that, and and it's not. It's not as good as like say this to me, right? You know, and that's an example of like full on production with like musicians, right. and so it's it's music is is interesting in that way. It doesn't, it's not always just what you think would work. Like sometimes it's it goes against the grain of like uh, your better judgment somehow, or I'm I'm not wording that right, but right it goes against. Uh, I don't know. I don't know why I can't think of the word I'm looking for. Well, I agree. Not every... Counterintuitive. <laughs> yeah, and, and and that's part of the musical process. Too. That's the taste part. Not every yeah. record should be highly produced. Right. Some of the, like some of my favorite recordings are those Delta Blues recordings. It's just the guy singing and a guitar. Right. There is nothing else. Yeah. But it's so raw and visceral, and it captures the essence of what they're trying to convey. Yeah. If you tried to produce it, it doesn't sound good. Right. You know, the, and the stuff I produced down there, or and we also did some sessions in Seattle with, with right. this particular guy, 
named C. Del Davis. Yeah. We kept it raw like that. We didn't try to fix his vocals. We just left it the way it was. Right, right. Because that's who he was. You know? Yeah. Hey, dude, I'm just worried about yeah, I can us still hear hearing it, it and yeah, then yeah. us not being able to put this up because yeah, yeah. of the copyright go stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's uh, I could still hear it, but I, I, it's kind of nice. I'm just worried about copyright stuff. <laughs> oh, <laughs> okay. right, because you, right, you don't want it bleeding through. Where, right, like yeah. ble- I, and I'm probably being ultra sensitive, and you, probably people listening can't even really hear it. But Right, but we don't want it to get We can flagged. hear Everybody Knows by Leonard Cohen right now right. in the background. Yeah, it's coming through these PA speakers, I think. Yeah. Anyway, we run in a, a very <clears throat> professional environment right here. Bro. Yeah, clearly. And <laughs> <laughs> this is a highly professional situation you've walked into. Okay, sir. What are we on? <laughs> so, well, yeah. so, so, okay. So, at that time, and are you like, you you already been in Skin Yard, you already toured, so you're probably not blown away that you're in the Screaming Trees, or are you like super psyched about it, or and is there, and also you're seeing all this huge success, and you know you can tell your band is killer. Mark's obviously a superstar, just he exudes that vibe, and he's so talented, and y'all were talented. So like, did you think? holy shit, we're about to blow up? Or what was your state of mind like during that time? Well, I mean, like most people, I was hopeful that the band would do well. And we did in a relative sense. Oh, yeah, but, you absolutely. know, but we didn't sell millions and millions of records and become, you know, like a gigantic band. Right. Um, and, you know, like a lot of bands at that time, we had our own kind of self-destructive yes, tendencies. You know, it's just... Volatile yeah. Yeah, you guys you were, yeah. You guys were volatile. Yeah. It was a volatile band. Um, and, and of course, as we now know historically, you know, there were there a lot of people died during that period. You know, there was yeah. about a five-year period. Heroin. And, and heroin overdoses and, and just a lot of excess. Mm-hmm. And, um, and it started to tear the bands apart. So... Um, you know, the Screaming Trees did make another excellent record called Dust, which we did most of it in L.A., but we did a lot of it out here in New mm-hmm. York. And it was mixed out here in New York by Andy Wallace. Both records were mixed by Andy Wallace. And uh, that kind of took us into the late 90s, and the band was starting to wind down. So mm-hmm. we um, we did a few more recording sessions that I produced, and those came out later as a album called Last Words. But then by 2000, the band was broken up. We played our last show, and uh, everybody just kind of went their separate ways. Mm. And what's been cool about that is that, like, everybody in our band survived, and we all stayed friends, you know, yeah. to greater or lesser degrees, you know. Yeah. And, um, you know, you and I still talk with Lanigan, and I still talk with the brothers, and I think yeah. those guys still talk to each other. Other bands didn't fare so well, you right. know. Like I did the Mad Season yes. band with yeah. with Lane Staley and McCready. and McCready, Mike McCready from Pearl Jam, and a great, incredible bass player named Baker Saunders, who is from Chicago. Yeah. Like he was an electric blues guy, and uh, that band made one amazing album. And we tried to make a second album. We did record a, a lot of basic tracks for a second album, but then Lane passed away, and and Baker pa- passed away right before Lane did. So I started to see this thing where bands, you know, that had great potential, but could also that creativity can also turn and become turn on you. and turn and become destructive. Yeah. And that's about the time that I I decided to stop doing rock and roll for a while and go back yeah. to school and just study music. Wow. Interesting, because I like I actually do think like people that have huge creative voices, if you don't if you don't sort of keep expressing it externally yeah it will destroy it can destroy you and there's yeah. such a precedent for that for right. people that have to like for whatever reason might suppress their voice and right. um, i think that can it can really turn on people i think yep. like better to be um better to be expressive and take whatever lashings you're gonna get from that yeah because you will if you express yourself in this world you're, you're gonna get some lashings for it but it's better to take them yep. than to than to like stifle your voice because that thing left stifled inside of you is a, is is like it's like the powder keg i totally agree i think you know this this goes this goes back to ancient mysticism mysticism as well because creativity is often 
has a destructive element. You have yeah, to like it's yin and yang, <clears throat> right? You have to destroy and level so that you can build the castle, right? But the castle eventually, the sand castle eventually is destroyed by the ocean, yeah. And the, so you build it again. You know, it's like what my wife would say. It's all it's all a, a sand painting. Yeah, you you create this beautiful sand painting. You know, Tibetan sand painting, Navajo sand painting. You create this incredible intricate thing. And then you deliberately destroy it because mm-hmm. it's in the doing of it mm-hmm. that you you evolve yourself. That's right. Yeah. You and, and it all it all is one big sand painting anyway. Totally. And none of it's going to last forever. That's right. What was Lane Stanley like? He's such an interesting figure. I, I am a huge fan of his. And, and he just has this. No one like him. I And I have no idea what he was like or anything. But he has this like. It's such an interesting voice and energy and just like a tragic story, obviously. But yeah, uh, what was he like to work with? I mean, my memory of him and, you know, so I met him in about 1993 when the Screaming Trees opened for Alice in Chains. So we were, oh, okay. Sweet Oblivion had come out and Dirt came out mm-hmm. within a few months of each other. And we did a whole huge, I mean, almost a world tour, all of Europe, all of North America, Australia. And then we all kind of did our own things. And um, so we spent, you know, many, nine months on the road. Wow. And then uh, and we became friends. And, and I was already kind of friends with McCready because McCready would come see the Screaming Trees and he would sit right behind my drums. Uh-huh. Just like, you can't see him, but he's back there, like yeah. behind the drum riser. You can't he, see him, but you can feel him. <clears throat> yeah. Tech well, he's not, yeah. A, he's not a huge guy either, you know, but yeah, he, he'd just be back there like rocking out behind the drums at some of our shows. And so he called me and he said, uh, he's like, I want to do this side thing with you and Lane. And there's this bass player that I met in rehab. Mm-hmm. And, I, and I, I think we can do something, you know, something kind of bluesy and cool and different from our other bands. And so that became Mad Season. But I already knew Lane and Lane had this. He was great because he was like, he had a very youthful, I mean, we were... I, 25 at the time 26 mm-hmm. i mean we're still really young but even but back then 26 yeah. actually seemed like old because it <laughs> yeah, was supposed yeah. to be done by 27 right right exactly yeah. you know this relative age thing yeah but he had this great he's super funny great sense of humor like very lighthearted and and yeah. um and and he was like a really good dude you know like right. he was cool and i remember at those shows you know there every show we played together was sold out you know mm-hmm. you could not buy a ticket right and there were always kids out front that wanted to get in, and Lane would give his guest list to those kids that couldn't get in. Wow! That like that those were his guests, were the yeah. kids like on the street trying to get a ticket. That's awesome. And so he would do that, and um, I just remember laughing a lot on the bus. Sometimes he'd ride on our bus, and we'd all be together backstage. But that's all we saw was the inside of the bus and the backstage because yeah. we were driving so far every night after yeah. every show. Like we never had time off. So then when we got into the studio to do Mad Season, you know, he was just he was really happy to be there to do something a little different, play with different people. Mm-hmm. And it was just it was a very light up up yeah. experience, you yeah. know, like um, and, and we were also sober at the time. Oh really? This, yeah, everybody I, was sober. Was, um, <clears throat> yeah, Creedy got oh, yeah. sober. That's why he was out of Pearl Jam. The right. bass player was in in rehab. That, and that's that's how where they, they met. met. Yeah, but did you I know? was sober too. Right. I I had gotten off that tour, and I was like, man, I need to change my life too. You know, I really do. And uh, and Lane was too. Did you go into a program or did I mean? A re- I didn't a and rehab or no, no rehab. It, I didn't do rehab. I never and, really did either. I just yeah. I would just rehab my life. And I would go I, to yeah. meetings all the time, every yeah. day. Like I would, I just, I could rehab myself. Yeah, but I would some definitely, can, yeah. it would, some can, yeah. yeah. But it would definitely be like a huge. I would make a decision to change right. everything in my life. Yeah, it know? it is an internal decision. You yeah. make the decision, and then the doing of it is not as hard. I mean, there's still right. challenging moments, but absolutely, you make the internal decision. Like I need to change who I am yeah. and how I'm living my life. And then it begins. Then a different path unfolds for you. That's right. So we made that record and we were sober. And then we started above. Wor- the above record. Yeah. And that came out in 95. Mm-hmm. And then we started working on a second album that, I mean, we had a lot of songs. I mean, it was close to 20 songs. And, just like um, us, man. Just like us. And, but, but Lane just, he, he relapsed and he wasn't able to do it. And uh, so we never finished the second album. Yeah. Yeah. It's too bad. Yeah. 
and and Baker did as well. So lost two guys from that band. Yeah, and you know that, you know it, it starts to really affect you after a while because we all had friends that passed away, and I wasn't necessarily in a band with them, but there were like two other bands that I played in that lost somebody. You know, yeah. and so after a while, you see this pattern, and you realize, man, there's a lot of self destruction in this particular place, in this city, in this region, yeah. and um, you know, you you gotta, you have to change your life, or or the or a similar thing can happen to you. Yeah, and so I di- I did. I moved to L.A. I started doing studio session work, playing on, like you mentioned, the Queens of the Stone Age album. And uh-huh. did Lanigan bring you into that or not? No, jo- oh, right. jo- that's a good question. Josh Homme had been playing in the Screaming Trees on that final world tour. Uh, he was our second. Really? Yeah, he was our second guitar player. Uh, There's videos of him playing rhythm guitar before with us. Before or after Caius? Uh, As Caius had broken up. Oh, and he was oh, looking okay. for some somebody to, to play with. And the Trees, you know, were a pretty well-known band. Really? And he... He, I, he expressed that he wanted to play with us, and so we said, "Well, do you want to be the second? And so he became the second guitar I didn't know player. That's how they met. Though. Yeah, wow. and then cool. and then when Josh, you know, put the Queens together, I played on some of the early demos at, in Joshua Tree at that Rancho Studio. Yeah, and then Dave Catching, Dave place. Catching, who you've Shout had out. on the show. Shout hey, out Dave. Dave. Hey, Dave Catching. Hey, Dave. Dave, we miss you. <clears throat> Dave Catching. The kindest musician on the planet. He's such a lovely person. Yeah, probably I is. Yeah. yeah. The desert sessions out there. Yeah, I, I did. Too. I played on desert right. sessions that Josh was it. producing, and so I didn't play on the first Queens record. But then when they made Rated R, Josh called me and he said, "Would you just bring all your cool percussion? Bring the vibes. Bring the marimbas. Smart. Bring all the, like like tablas and doombecks and shakers and all this stuff." And Chris Goss was the producer. And Chris Goss from Masters of Reality, also right. an amazing Damn band. That. Do you know and, Matthias? <clears throat> uh, probably met him, but... Schneeberger? Oh, yeah. Or? Oh, yeah. Schneeby. Schneeby. Yes, yeah, yeah totally. Yeah. yeah. I know Matthias. Yeah. I worked with him. Anyway, keep going. So, and he just said, just bring all... <laughs> bring, just bring your stuff down. It was at Sound City. Yeah. Oh, but really? In, in the room with the famous yeah. Neve console. Bro, that, I made yeah. Come to Where I'm From in Sound City. No in, kidding. In the, in the room with the famous Neve. With the Neve, the Dave yeah. Grohl now. Yeah, the, the yeah. Dave Grohl Neve. Dave That's, played uh, on In the Sun, a version of In the Sun oh, cool. that we didn't use. But, okay. Yeah. Or you did and you don't know. Maybe. It could be on the bonus thing. All right. They don't know I, I which don't track know. he's on, but he's on one well, of them. Well, you can <laughs> usually tell immediately yeah, when Dave Grohl is playing yeah, the drums, you, think, you know? You, yeah. You it might be him. Yeah. Well, that's the only session I ever did at that studio, but... and. Uh, Rob Halford from Judas Priest was in the opposite room doing, I think he was doing a solo record, and Josh invited him to come over and do the backup vocals on that that song. <laughs> I can't remember what, I can't remember oh, the name oh, of it, yeah, but you'll, you'll have to look it up. I didn't even know he was on that. Yeah, he does backup vocals Crazy. on that. That's funny. Yeah. So, so, yeah, I guess I played vibes on a few songs and that is sort of the introduction of vibraphone into modern rock and roll yeah, but it's and because that one other percussion thing hand per- dun, 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 dun. oh yeah there's uh um, what song is that, that well there's uh there's steel drums on a couple songs there's vibes there's and we have steel drums and vibes on our new band well yeah yeah i mean you got to use the metal feel the metal good hit of the summer. that's it feel good hit of the summer that was right. it rob halford came over and yeah, did backup vocals on that so 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 and I played on a bunch of I played on I played like Marimba on a Stone Temple Pilots record. I played on right, the R. E. M. albums. I played did a lot of stuff with really great singer songwriters, people like Victoria Williams. I and, love her. Yeah, Another she's a desert person. She's, yeah, be- she's yeah. in Joshua Tree. She's in Joshua Tree. She's a beautiful singer. Mark Eitzel, we were talking about Mark uh-huh. Eitzel. And Another and just a, and, a, and like uh Mark Olson, Gary Loris from the Jayhawks. Mm-hmm. I've done stuff with wow. them. So I did, and I and I did some film soundtrack stuff. So I got kind of all this experience working on big records and and working at big studios, and I got more production experience. And uh, but I wasn't quite ready to jump right back into the music world. So that's when I went back to school. Or join a band at that time. You were done. Uh, yeah, I, I I wasn't really in a band for a long time. I just played with people, but I I didn't have a band. When you, you know? jump back into school, what'd you do? What'd I went, you study? I studied, um, well, I got into an anthropology program because they had ethnomusicology in the, in the anthropology program. So, yeah. And so I did my undergrad in 
what's called ethno-linguistics. So it's the study of culture, language, and, and then things like music and, and What makes art. you interested in that kind of stuff? Because it's the best part of humanity. What do you, you know? mean by that? It's a good uh, answer. Uh, no, I mean, seriously, like, like yeah. learning about human culture, why we create the music we create or the paintings we create, or why do we write the poetry and the uh-huh. literature. Um, and it's mostly, the, it starts with, with a spiritual inspiration. Yeah. And it's different all over the world. But humanity... But there's just, relationships. It's a relationship. It's universal. Human beings want to express that relationship through those artistic mediums. Divi- their relationship to God? To God or whatever the particular, you know, whatever that inspiration is. The, it's the Amazon rainforest. It's the, it's the Arctic. It's, it's um, the, the, the religion or spiritual practices of, a, of a, any given culture. Yeah. Find a way to come through in their music and, and their art and their literature and it's the it's the highest expression of it where do you think your interest like it, your interest in this stuff came from because i agree with you it is like the best part of what makes us human or something yeah. or one of the yeah. most essential parts but most people don't uh submerge themselves into study of this and 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 go and get so passionate to this degree where where'd you get that from your mom or your dad or or do you do you have any idea? Have you ever thought of that? Why, why you're doing that? Well, I grew up in a. I grew up out in the woods, you know, like on a homestead, you know, right. where we raised our animals, and so. But my mom was very musical, and and my dad was kind of musical, uh-huh. and so I, there was always a music component, and I, some part of me must have connected that to just growing up in nature, and you know. Like one of the strongest memories I have as a kid, because we grew up near a wetlands, mm-hmm. and I remember in the summer when I at night the frogs croaking in the in the wetlands was so loud, but it mm. was so cool, you know. And like that's what I remember as a kid, things like that. I but as far as like why I love this stuff, I think you know there's that thing where where, where you you feel compelled to do certain things, you know, like as a musician, you know, you're pulled to do it. You know, they often say like music makes you do music, you know, you can't do it unless it wants you to do it, you know? Mm -hmm. And one of the things that really struck me when I started taking ethnomusicology classes is one of the strongest theories is that music's a survival mechanism. Because in the beginning, when humans were, were grouping together in small tribal units, the music and the collective, whatever it was, like we were collectively singing the first songs with our first languages or whatever it was. Right. And we're like probably playing percussion. And one of the theories was that we were literally using the bones of our ancestors because they're hollow and they make a certain kind of, you know, sound. Uh-huh. And we're like creating the first rhythms and we're singing and it pulled people together to form a group Mm -hmm. and in that group is safety and mutual support Mm -hmm. and taking care of one another, right? Making sure everybody's fed, making sure everybody feels safe, making sure everybody, you know, is brought in to the fire, so to speak. So I started thinking very differently about music. I started thinking this isn't entertainment. It is, but it's more, it's deeper than the entertainment aspect. It's about pulling people together, creating a sense of community, a sense of common, you know, a oneness, so to speak. Yeah. And we've all felt that. You go to an amazing show and you just feel good afterwards. And everybody that was there had a different personal experience, but mm-hmm. collectively, everybody feels quite a bit better. Yeah, music is survival. It's, it, it helps us survive. Yeah, and just inform community and stuff and how important community is to humanity. Exactly. Which, can, which, which is a, a blessing and a curse because... Like particularly now, like people are so afraid to use their voices because of getting excommunicated or canceled from the community, and right? That, and that is such right. a deep fear because because that to be to be excommunicated is akin to dying, right? So that's why people are just terrified to say right. anything against the grain. It's like being exiled and sent into the wilderness, you know, right. which is like a kind of death sentence, right? Exiled on Main Street, yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, well, I totally believe yeah. in the. I believe in just the general theory that everybody needs to be listened to. Everybody mm-hmm. needs to have their, even people that you don't agree with politically or spiritually right. or whatever. 
Every single person has a gift. Right. They have something to offer. Right. You just got to listen and go deep enough and find what that is. Right. And, and each person has a responsibility to find it within themselves. I mean, it's, yeah. it's mutual. I saw this Fred, Frederick Douglass quote that said, uh, um, freedom of speech is a double, or like taking away freedom of speech is a double negative because it hurts it hurts both the speaker and the person taking it away or something. Right, I'm, I'm right. butchering the quote, but the, the, the vibe is basically, it really does hurt everybody. And, right. and, and actually, too, like if you try to squash a perspective on something, you're actually amping that perspective that you're squashing up. Right, like right. Maybe not immediately, but in right. like, but like, if you just like, you're, you're actually giving, you're bolstering it, to be right. honest. Right. Better to let it express itself. Right. Because also, like, the fear of letting it express itself is also uh, going to send off alarm bells in a lot of people. And that's where the bolstering of it comes from. Because not only right. now is it an expression, but it also is an expression with alarm bells all over it. Like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, well, one of the things, this, this is another one of those kind of like anthropology things. Human beings like to put people into categories uh -huh. and put labels on them. Right, it's it goes the, with that whole tribal it, stuff. Right, yeah. but it's really the worst thing to do because yeah. then you put somebody, you know, like in this category and you try to hold them there. Yeah. You know, it's like what societies do with caste systems uh -huh. or, or, right. or, or hierarchical systems of power where you, yeah. you're like, well, you're born here, so you stay there. And yeah. then that's not right. Yeah. But when you, like, just... I've had this conversation with people um, about the United States because, uh -huh. you know, we've all toured this whole country. We've played in all 50 states right, right. and personally driven across most of them myself. Absolutely, you know, yeah. I've spent a lot of time in the South. Uh -huh. I spent a lot of time it, and some of the coolest, like most intelligent and creative and interesting people I've ever met are in places where I don't really spend a lot of time yeah, where you wouldn't expect it, but you maybe. find them. Yeah, of and so I don't, I just absolutely don't buy into this thing of like red state, blue state, you know, like good, evil, that. like th that's just nonsense. It's, it's designed to, it's designed to divide us it's to keep us totally. apart. It's, 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 it, it's yeah. a, it's a, yeah. it's a bigger play at work. Yeah. It's like we're, we're, all, yeah. you know, we are one and we should, I think, focus more on love and our, and our, uh, that's and, right. And unity. And I mean, and I'm speaking to myself with that too, because yeah. I can, I can fall into those traps just as much as anybody else. And, pick a side and dig in and speak out and all that. And some of that's important and you should, but also it's like what you focus on, like, you know, what you right. focus on, right. you'll create. But. Well, it's like we were talking about, I love that, uh, that quote by Aristotle, which is like the mark of a good mind is the ability to hold two opposing ideas and yeah. just look at them. I love just that. Look at, look at it. Yeah. You don't have to make a decision right away. Right. You, you, you might lean one way or the other, but just look at it. Right, you know? right, right. Well, but and, people are taught to give away their critical thinking ability through trauma and fear. Because if right. you traumatize and, and make people afraid enough and then tell them what to think, it's just safer. It, right. it feels safer if they just agree. Because, you know, like right. it, it, it takes courage to to think freely, and if you're in a f constant state of flight or fright, you you can't you can't conjure that courage up right. because you're in survival right. mode. If right. you're in survival mode, you're going you're gonna you know you're in survival mode. You're gonna hang on to this, hang on to that, and, and right. like do this. Like you're not gonna be like open and like okay, let's see, let's explore. To be open and explore and creative, you can't be in flight or fright. That's right. You know, another thing, too, about, and I mean, we're musicians, we're people that have traveled all over the world, so we've seen the commonalities between people. We, yeah. we see it within this, within this country, and I also have seen, you know, you go to the Amazon rainforest and you think, and it is a totally different environment, yeah. but they care about the same things we do. Absolutely. They care about, like, raising their kids to be healthy yeah, and exactly. educated and safe, and they just, want to, they just want to be able to, like, live their lives, yeah. you know? But there's this other thing about music, which, uh, again, is one of those kind of, early anthropological things is that writing music, singing, creating this sound together in a community creates the ability for abstract thinking, mm. right? Because it's invisible, you can't see it, but mm. yet everybody's agreeing to play this rhythm together or mm -hmm. sing this melody together and we know the words because they, the words are a story that we have collectively. Mm -hmm. And so when you have 
the the ability to think like that you create the ability to think abstractly and think you know deeply and critically about things it expands the mind Mm -hmm. just like visual art does the same thing visual art is very abstract but it helps you you know that's how they told stories was by painting then it became photographs then it became silent movies then it became films and then now it's virtual reality Mm -hmm. you know you you convey these deeper ideas of the human species through music visual art storytelling film it's really important you know? Absolutely, because also you know it's like you know the, it's just another method of communicating, but it's a method of communicating mystical things and spiritual things. That's right, and it's hard yeah. to do that with just words. I mean, if you're a poet, you can do it with words, but not everybody's a poet, you know. So it's right. like, yeah, it, it, these are really important things. But before poetry was written down, like like the the bardic poets, uh, you know, the Celtic poets and the and you know this this tradition has existed all over the world. It's like the shaman stands mm-hmm. up in front of the village and tells the story. Mm-hmm. It's the ability to to orate and tell verbally this story or this poem. Mm-hmm. That's that's always been there. You know, mm-hmm. that's as old as the music. Right. It's just then we figured out how to make paper and write it down yeah. and and bind them into books and. Yeah. You know, or the internet, you know, whatever it is, we find a, a way to convey it. Yeah, well, words are just so powerful. It's like, first of all, was the word, you know, it's like right. the words are like the epicenter of creation. And that's why um, there's so much fear around allowing people to express their voices, because that is people's source of power. Right. And the more they realize that, like, it's not, you know, it's the fact that you are able to speak or are able to express yourself at all is the gift, not the result that you get from expressing yourself. Right. And I think more people need to realize that. Here's an interesting thing, a parallel between music and words that I was thinking about just a couple days ago. There's John Cage is one of these people that thinks like this, but so did Beethoven, Uh which is that music is the space between the notes. Right. Right. Because like in Western music, we're dealing with 12 notes. It's fixed. Mm -hmm. So the space that you use between the 12 notes is the music. Right. The same thing is true of words. You know, a word by itself is just a word by itself. Right. And some words are more loaded than than others. You know, there's a whole story that goes with that one word. But the sequence of the words and how you string them together that's the narrative right there yeah but what's interesting to think about is that it's all about the space in between Uh between the notes between the words yeah that's where the message comes through yeah and how do you how does that work how does that operate in your life well i think a lot about how i mean i i mean it's it's just kind of a combination of spirit and science i guess but i'm I'm really interested in what they're learning about quantum you know about how everything the entire universe is made up of these tiny subatomic particles and probably it goes smaller than that right like why would it be limited in in any it's it's infinite going out and going in right probably but the more you look at that the more you realize it's mostly space Mm -hmm. it's mostly emptiness that that makes up this universe that we're experiencing so i just kind of think of it like huh interesting emptiness and space is more what there is than there is physical Uh and so apply that theorem to as i said music yeah it's mostly space with demarcated notes and rhythms in between yeah and language is the same way you know yeah, it reminds me of music for airports, Brian Eno. Like, yeah. Because that was such a legendary landmark album, and it's still so incredible when I put that on, and just how minimal it is, and yet how complete it is. Right, yeah. It's just, yeah. it's stunning in that way. It's yeah. just like, how did you do that? It's such a trick, because it's like, it's a, it's so, it's more about the space. Yeah, totally. And I, I mean, I've never met Brian Eno, but I'd love to ask him how much he was influenced by Bay. Call him up, Joe. <laughs> yeah, call, you've got him on oh, speed man. dial there, yeah, man. Let me see. Oh, Brian, he's, he Garrett just texted me. That's so weird. <laughs> <laughs> it's the same with comedy. The, the, yeah, I was the, thinking oh, that. Yes. That's a good one. Yeah, yeah when you space stop in between. And right. you give it room to breathe. There's a science to that. Right. That. Yeah. Not just I in the delivery, uh, yeah. Not just in the yeah. delivery of the joke, yeah, but no, also the knowing when to pause. Yeah, and comedy, That's where the comedy is. Yeah. 
is tragedy plus time. Yeah, yeah. You know? Yeah. Just like, uh, what's the difference between a conspiracy theory and reality? About six to 12 months. <laughs> Okay. Still, right. still got it. I'm here all day. But I'm all, here all day. This is where the drummer needs to do it. So. I'm here all week. I'm here all week. Well, you know. well, that's funny. Not to get off topic with you guys, but I'm still Because we're going a little esoteric. You no, 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 it's back. good, though. It's I'm good. still geeking out. There was one question before. I have we, another Lanigan question. Before, before, yeah, right. before we leave Let the take trees, leave. Uh, maybe this is your question. Was there a show on the tour with Alice in Chains where Lanigan um, was in the hospital and Lane stepped in and did the entire show with you guys? Uh, that's true, but he did not do the entire show. I uh, remember it was in Europe, I'm pretty sure. And, in and Germany. Uh, is that where I was? <laughs> I don't know. I'm joking. You know we more just, about this than I do. We just said everything no, that happens video, in Germany. That video exists, though. I've seen it. Oh, it's, I haven't seen it's it. It's the I Screaming Trees it backing up lane okay. and we really just i think we only did two or three songs and, and it was, was basically it. because we had to fulfill the contractual amount of time on stage ah. you know that's all it was and what it, did he sing your uh, screaming I tree songs or he, you did it? i remember him doing nearly lost you and there's ah. a video of that and i don't i can't remember but i don't think it's more than three songs all right. yeah if the video exists i haven't seen it i don't know interesting which is a weird thing to say because now everything's on Everything video. Exists, but back then, yeah. you know, it's like a random show. Maybe mm. somebody filmed it and it would have been with a gigantic video Probably. camera, you know. I just found a single VHS tape that has a Screaming Tree show from Europe. Yeah. And I, but it's on Betamax or whatever the European. So I have to get it transferred yeah, so I can, because yeah. I, I have no idea what it looks like or sounds like. Do you collect like. bootlegs from stuff you Not really at all. Want, it was just a all. video. Because what happened back then, and I think it's still true today, every show that's ever played is videotaped, but from the, uh, you know, probably from high up. Because if there's an incident, or an accident, mm -hmm. they, there's a videotape of it. It's like an insurance thing. Mm -hmm. So every show that was done, like in the big amphitheaters and concerts, there's a videotape of it. And somehow, like I ended up with a huge box of these things. Wow. And at one point we were going to do somebody would want though. Well, they, they're Joe in. Burns. They're in the Sony. <laughs> they're in the Sony vault. Oh, okay. But okay. my mom was cleaning out like a closet at their house and she found oh, one tape. VHS tape. And so I'm going to transfer it and see what it looks like. I don't even know. What about that Letterman performance where you're not playing drums? <laughs> what, what's that? And Lanigan's got a black He's guy. got a big, okay. Well, he wrote it. the story there. <laughs> he wrote about it in his book, but it's a true story. We, yeah. we were supposed to play at the Stone Pony uh -huh. in Asbury Park. Great venue. Yeah, it's a great place. And we went there a, a day early because we had a night off and we went in and we had some drinks in the bar and we came outside and Lanigan was in front of me and, and I was maybe 30 seconds behind him and he walked out and then I walk out and there's a full street fight happening. Uh -huh. There's like about six guys attacking Mark. So I jump in. They and, just jumped him? Yeah, I, I don't really know what happened. And okay. I'm not sure Mark does either because, you know, we were drinking at the time. And probably long hairs and they were like threatened by the long yeah, hair. Yeah, we all had super long hair and, you know, like we're like... Both big and tall. Yeah, we're both big dudes. Everybody in the Screaming Trees was yeah, like... Yeah, I wouldn't mess with you, dude. Yeah. I, I, you know, <laughs> I'm a big person and I box and everything, but if I saw you walking down the street, I'd go oh, ahead man. and say, I'm not messing with that dude. I'm a man of peace. I'm not interested yeah, in yeah, any Yeah, now that I know stuff, you, but, but like... Yeah, but just at back a then... At a Lance, it's like well i was 25 and full of piss and vinegar and yeah. so so was everybody else so anyway we just like <laughs> anyway this full street brawl ensued uh -huh. and there were a lot of people in it and um <laughs> we actually kind of fought everybody off and and then the bouncers in the club came out and it broke it up and the the guys that attacked us just ran away they were just local toughs yeah. you know thugs and uh, Lanigan had a big black eye, and I didn't feel like I had been injured at all. I felt fine, but I yeah. got back to the hotel, and my left shoulder was like, you know, hanging. Right. You know, I'd, I'd gotten like a 
karate chop or something. Broken collarbone? No, it was just separated. They, I didn't uh, break any bones, but it, the karate chop. it was like a, it, it had, it had, <laughs> no, it, it had been dislocated. As karate, karate chops, chops do. <laughs> it had been, it had been. <laughs> Never underestimate karate exactly. chops. <laughs> my wife. In fact, she, we need to bring back karate she, chops. People aren't. <laughs> my wife back there has a black belt in Shotokan karate. Oh, wow. Yeah, she, she could come wow. demonstrate. She's my body. How to numb your, uh, your left uh, arm. <laughs> She's my bodyguard. Um, so anyway, my shoulder was hanging and I had to go to the emergency room and we were supposed to play Letterman the next night and it was uh, obvious I was not in it. We had, we did have to cancel a couple show, shows till my shoulder cause it pulled back, mm. you know, the dislocation pulled back in. And, uh, so anyway, the great Steve Ferrone mm-hmm. who pl- was playing with Tom Petty at the time subbed as the drummer. And oh, that he wasn't the Letterman drummer? Well, he, I, I don't know. I, cause I mean, I wasn't really paying attention to there yeah but no i was there i was backstage and i came out at the end of the show with my arm in a sling Uh, you know because lanning or uh letterman liked us a lot yeah he kind of liked that we were all rough and tumble and (laughs) and he invited yeah 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 Yeah. Yeah. so he invited us out at the end and so we all like came out and said hi i thought he meant you you, sat at the you did the couch well, no, he didn't interview us, but it was uh, it was just like the goodbye. Well, it was something. around Thanksgiving, uh-huh. and they had had like a Thanksgiving chef on the yeah. Letterman show, and and they'd cooked all this food. And so after we played, Letterman was like, you know, this whole meal is like a mere snack for the screaming trees. Why don't we invite them back out to come? And so we came out and mm. ate some food on the table. Oh, that I was see. like it was like a like. Yeah, spontaneous kind of thing. A bit sort yeah. Of thing. But 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 Lanigan did great. He's got a huge black eye. It's you know, you can watch it. It's yeah. again it's for it. I didn't see it. Yeah. I really or no, or, I nearly that was the so, that I was the, lost that was the hit. Wait, one so. more Lanigan question. Yeah. Did you read his memoir? Yeah, I loved it. And yeah. were there things there that were eye openers to you or I mean I knew most of that did you stuff. Call because, him after and like no, say, no, no, no. Mark Mark actually sent me some pages of the book before he published it and he said because he said, I'm trying to remember some of this stuff and you were there, so what did you remember? I told him what I remembered and then he, he showed me what he wrote and I was like, Yeah, I think that's pretty i mean you know i read the book and i laughed out loud quite a few times Mm -hmm. not not because it's horrible to that anybody went through this stuff but i just remember it because you know a lot of it happened when during the the 10 years that i was in the band but of course there was stuff i didn't know about or you know kind of you know knew a little bit but didn't know he put he he, he puts it he puts it in quite vivid detail but my my personal feeling is just that he's a great writer natural storyteller and quite funny yeah and and it's a heavy book yeah but backwards and weep yeah but it's uh but i i i've I bought it and I read it like in a couple of days and, and, uh, I recommend it if you want to know like the grittiness of being in a rock band in the 1990s. What a time to do that. Right. Like, yeah. That, that, yeah. That's gone now. Like yeah, there's, there's other versions of it and it's cool. And I'm not like one of these old curmudgeon like, well, back then it was real, you know, yeah, but, yeah. but at the same time, it's like, it was unique. It was uh, yeah. it was an exceptional time to do it, and you yeah. just never know how lucky you are in in until until you know until like time goes know. by. You know, I I lament that those opportunities don't exist for the next generation of bands because yeah. back then, you know, you could tour. And, you know, gas was like less than a dollar a gallon and you could put four or five guys in a van yeah. and you could play all over the country and you could go to Europe and you yeah. didn't really need to make that much money to do it. And you could yeah. build your following. And I just don't know how I wish young people could still do that. I don't and, know how and, they do it. Yeah, And when you went to Europe, you really went to a foreign place. Like, oh, yeah. Even now, no matter where you travel in the world, you take your device with you. And it's the same entertainment setup you have anywhere you go. So it's right. like, you're just going to lean on that. You're not going to let... But I just remember touring in France and just being authentically bored in a hotel room, like like trying to flip through four channels of just French-speaking stuff <laughs> and like right. going like, uh... Right. And just like, but that feeling of being a stranger in a strange land and then yeah. eventually you have to turn the TV off because you're just not going to sit there and watch like you know people speaking a language you don't understand and then you start writing poetry or something right, like right you get into like you, you know you're sort of do these like weird natural dopamine detoxes and 
you like get into life you become more in the moment whereas now if you did it you just turn on your device and go check your instagram and right keep right. looking at everything that you looked at when you were in ohio same thing like right like, you know what i mean what I remember when I remember the first time I went to Europe was 1986, mm-hmm. actually. So as no a, internet yet at no, all. No, no. And then, and then the first time I toured there was 91. I mean, I toured there every year through the 1990s. And I mean, I was a much younger man back then. And I remember even though we'd play a show and stay up till two or three o'clock in the morning, I would still make myself get up at six or seven o'clock walk around. And, and I'd get up and I'd walk around because I wanted to see nice. what is right. what is Paris like at six o'clock in the morning, <laughs> right. you know, at, or what is Rome like, you know, because yeah. you can't see it at night. You're playing yeah. a show. And I, I didn't sleep very much. And I just walked yeah. like Every every day I could walk, I would just walk miles and miles, and I loved it. Yeah, I, I mean, even today, like when I woke up, I didn't really, like. I got up, and it, there's a nine thirty yoga class in, in Williamsburg, but it took, for me to get there and run there, I, it, it takes me an hour. It's five miles away. Right. It takes me an hour to get there. Right. And so I have to be out of my house. I have to be out the door by like eight fifteen, eight eight thirty at the latest, at the absolute right. latest, or I'm not going to make it. Right. And I just like make myself do it because it's like I know I'm gonna win the day. Like it's just like you because you get when you like make yourself do something hard in life. Like the, the, you, it just pays great dividends because if you just yeah. like like right. lay back and just right. be like lazily move, it's like you just right. get this ho hum energy going. Yeah, you, you almost yeah. have to lean into like oxygenating yourself and getting out into the sun and doing that, and then you. You can give yourself that youthful energy back because it's like, I don't know, there is much more natural energy when you're young to so it makes True. doing yeah. those things easier, right? which sort of like then multiplies on itself. Mm-hmm. But if you just remember that as an older cat, you mm-hmm. can still make your, you can still kind of create that energy. Right. It, it also kind of comes full circle because as you get older, you can't sleep as much. Right. So I notice as I get older, I'm starting to wake up earlier again. Yeah. So I just call it like the old man power, uh-huh. which is like you just develop this kind of like I've got, you know, this kind of long term, like kind of toughened, you know, toughened by the world. Mm-hmm. And uh, I may not be as fast or as strong, but I can I can just go. Yeah. You know, you just keep going. Yeah. So tell me about the books you've written. Like, oh, I've written, I've written and published two, and I'm finishing my third one uh-huh. right now. And the the first one uh, is called The Singing Earth, and I also did an audio book for it. Right. Um, Where so do people find that? Uh, I mean, it's it's widely distributed. It's on Amazon, Barnes and Noble, uh, Audible. Okay, you know, you can great. find it. It's in libraries, and wow. you can buy it anywhere really. Um, nice. But it's about my my musical work around the world. So the first um, the singing earth the singing earth yeah what a title I mean that is yeah that's just beautiful thank you yeah that I one lo- I love that that kind of named itself but it's it's basically about well, my it reminds me of this Amazon forest thing you were it's, talking about one of the chapters is that story yeah and, and it's about my work on six continents so it talks about early Seattle music scene and then it talks about all the different places that I went to where I studied music or did field work. So right. West Africa, Cuba, Brazil, Australia, New Zealand, the Arctic, Mississippi Delta, uh-huh. which is an incredible place. And, um, and you know, just like in little stories in between about just being on the road, being a musician and working with people around the world. Uh-huh. Where'd you get the title? Um, I can't remember. I, I think... I had various working titles. Like one of them was called "Lay Down the Thunder." You know, that was one of them, mm-hmm. and and uh, it's still a good title. But some and at some point, it was like the Earth is singing. It probably came from the Amazon. You know, the Earth is always communicating, singing to mm-hmm. you. I just shortened it into the Singing Earth. The Singing Earth. And then I did a second book called "The Way of the Zen Cowboy," which was like about growing up in the Northwest because uh-huh. I grew up around actual cowboys right you know and so it was kind of like these like childhood stories that i heard or or like childhood experiences about like growing up in the 70s and loving muhammad ali and yeah you know like 
Because like back then, it seemed like everything was more possible, right? You could love Muhammad Ali and you could love cowboys. Yeah. You know, it didn't, you, you weren't like turned oh, into. God. You weren't a racist just because you, you love cowboys. Just because you like cowboys, you know, you're not. Yeah, exactly. You weren't put in a category. It's right. like, I loved Muhammad Ali. I loved Evil Knievel. I right. loved cowboys. I also yeah. loved Native Americans, you know, yeah. because I, I grew up with them. You know, I had some family members that were Native American. And yeah. and uh, so it's like you could just like like it all. Yeah. And find the cool stuff in all of it you know right. so i just wrote it was just kind of short stories about that stuff yeah and then the book i'm finishing right now is called still point and it's going to come out this fall uh -huh. um, in final edit mode and it's it's kind of about animals it's about this really? it's about uh, a year that my wife and i lived um out on this cliff above the ocean we, we rented a house just to write books and work on music uh -huh. and it was right above the Strait of Juan de Fuca, literally on a cliff, on a sea cliff. And yeah. we just had all these animals around us all the time. And, and I remembered all this stuff from my childhood. And so it's, they're kind of like, yeah. like little parables about animals and life and that kind of thing. Is there only one still, house there? Still point. What's, what's Is that? Is there only one house on that cliff or there's a No, there, there are others, but they're, but, the, but it's in a wildlife preserved so you know there's like eagles right above nesting above the house and and ravens and hawks and coyotes and deer and raccoons and mm. and, and when they communicate with you all the time like what like, How, well so? just i mean they're just always you can hear them talking to each other and and yeah. they were but specifically to you how well in in the way that like they were just saying kind of pay attention we're here like pay right. attention to your environment it's like what you and i were talking about you know yeah. we we all need to be aware of our environment yeah. like just pay attention yeah you know it'll tell you what it needs did you learn that from your wife like that kind of stuff like because she's like a serious meditator like that done yeah over three like can we say her name can we say her? yeah dr lisette garcia dr lisette garcia shout out dr shout lisette out garcia. dr lisette garcia <laughs> dr lisette garcia you know former college professor here in new york yeah Taught at Harvard, Columbia, John Jay, mm -hmm. uh, forensic psychologist, black belt in Shotokan karate, mm -hmm. and also a uh, heavy uh, Buddhist meditator, spent three and a half years in a silent meditation. In a silent meditation. That's yeah. just so far beyond most people's comprehension, beyond my comprehension. Silent meditation? Silent for three and a three half years. years. No, three and a half, bro. Like, don't oh, just throw out the six months. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. like, because before that, I heard yeah. about that. It was like, I heard about people meditating for 10 days, Vipassana and all that, which to me is like an astounding achievement. So I'm not trying to hate on sure, all y'all yeah, yeah. Vipassanas out there. Like, Are you guys together? What, I've never, what, I've what, never done, done I've, I've never done it. I've never done that. So let's do one. I would like to do that. Okay. It's inspired by this. Yeah. Like, for yeah. sure. I'll do it. Let's go three years, Papa. No, not three years. I'm not doing that. <laughs> that I'm leaving that to the pros. Like, I, I'll go with a Vipassana. I'll do, yeah. I won't leave this life without doing Vipassana. I'll right. do a 10 dayer. Yeah. I'm, I'm all about that like yeah. i can i think i can handle that i can train for that i can get with that but three and a half years is some other level type of stuff and like and she and it, and talking to her when she was talking about how the animals started communicating can you imagine how many magical well, portals that will open up if you go into that realm she has those stories so you're yeah. gonna have to have her on your show Yeah, we're gonna have I to know. have you on the podcast for sure because that is that's like yeah, that's the thing. It's like how, it's how like if you, you if you mess scared? with the if you mess with the whole like, you know, because I recently did a dopamine detox, which was and not a, not even against not even against my phone. That's even a weird Freudian slip. Like this, these things are <laughs> right. so weird. Like yeah. uh, not even off of my phone. I'm just talking about like to get rid of my kratom and kava addiction, right? Which right. I'm very proud I did, and then and and weed and stuff like that. So a very basic dopamine sure. detox, but yeah. E yeah. But even within that, you start opening up little realms of other creativity and stuff like that because right. all of a sudden, you need to like exercise more to fill that space or write poetry to fill that space. I mean, like for those of the, those of you out there that are like porn addicted, I haven't done porn in so long, but like you know getting rid of that opens up a whole other so it's like the process of elimination is also the process of addition right so when right. you eliminate to the degree of like going into a silent meditation for three and a half years can you imagine how profound the addition is because even in my little ways of eliminating things right 
the additions have be, been profound. Right. Well, the longest I ever went without speaking was a week. And I've, uh-huh. I've, I've never done a full Vipassana, but I've done, when I studied Zen in right. the Zendo, I did, you know, multi-day silent meditation retreats. Yeah. But what I noticed and what my wife told me about not speaking for that amount of time yeah. is how much energy goes into speaking, mm-hmm. into forming words and sentences like we're doing right now. Like the amount of spiritual energy to put through a word and a sentence and a conversation mm-hmm. is, huge. It is huge. So if you stop doing that and you just look inwardly, the, that's when you can really do major spiritual work. Right. What happens, do you think? Well, I mean, I've. I'm just speaking from my own experience, but I, I've been doing Zen meditation for about 25 years, and I studied right. with a with a Zen master, also a woman Zen master. And um, what I found was that in silent seated meditation, where the thoughts and the words and the stories, you know, start to get quieter and quieter, you begin to see all of these things we've been talking about, the, the, the universal connection between all things, uh-huh. between all people, between all, all things, all yeah. the table, you know, right. the, the, all animals, all elements, you know, you start to see that that internal part of you is what's happening out there. And that is a reflection of what's happening in here. Right. That's why also why the universe communicates. It's yeah. your internal coming back to you right so i mean all i can say is my my 25 year practice has it helped me get sober it helped me stay sober yeah um this is my 22nd year of sobriety yeah um it's helped me kind of be more refined and focused in my musical path yeah um and also just like it it helps me to see the best way that i can contribute to the world you know you and I were talking at dinner the other night. You talked about when you went to Uganda uh-huh. and you helped child children, soldiers, child yeah. soldiers, you yeah, know, find, help them, you know, with music, you yeah, know, or just that is incredibly powerful. Yeah, like yeah, 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 that's incredibly powerful. Like we have yeah. to find those things. It's great. It's great to make records. It's great to tour and play mm-hmm. shows mm-hmm. and give that to people. But there's also all this other stuff that we can do and you you just kind of figure it out over time Mm -hmm. but in order to figure it out you got to slow down Mm -hmm. everything you know and you got to slow down the talk and you got to slow down all the the things that we consume you know and just like slow it down and really listen and your your spirit will tell you yeah we're not being encouraged to empower ourselves and to love more like like it's, yeah. it would seem like at least in mainstream media it's not there's not this in, there's this encouragement towards division and fear there's this like hyper focus of fear and division and disempowerment and identification right. as a victim identification of needing external things to Like even, you know, I know this is a controversial thing to say nowadays, but to even like bolster your immune system, it has to come from outside. It has to come from something that's developed. We're not encouraged to like, what are the things you can do with the gifts that you have here now to make yourself like, you know, you know, it it, it comes down to a philosophical, like, uh, I guess a philosophical question, you know, like what, what, what you believe in, do you and I guess it ultimately comes down to like believing in God versus not believing in God to some degree, or at least that's how I can frame it. What do you, what do you think about all that kind of stuff? Well, just cause you brought up the word love and I, I think that's a really important word and it's not used enough and it's not used in the right way. Mm-hmm. I think that we need to really drop this, this pattern of like, putting people in a box and putting mm-hmm. a label on them and then deciding whether we like or dislike them. Right. Really. Yeah. You know, as, as, as they say, hate is, is too heavy of a burden to carry, yeah. you know, but love is something that is perpetually regenerated. It's yeah. infinite, you yeah. know, I mean, that's what, 
all the great masters said that, you know, Martin Luther King said that, you know, mm-hmm. you, it, 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 Jesus said that, the Buddha said that. All, JC. R- that's right. R- Rumi, <laughs> the great poet Rumi, you know, yeah, like Ram, Ram Das too. That's right. Ram Das. Yeah. I love Ram Das. And I too. met him one time really? in Taos, New Mexico. What was yeah. that like? Well, I didn't really get to talk with him. I just uh, like met him and yeah, just Got like, right, I don't think I even him. shook his hand. I think oh. I just tapped his We're knee or something. Yeah, yeah. 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 And, and so, you know, in learning to truly like, like realize that everything that's happening, it, it's your experience, you're part of it, yeah. and you don't need to hate any of it. You yeah. just accept that that's what it is, and you find the commonness, the, the, the common bonds that everybody has. And not just between people, but between you and your, your natural environment, between the forests and the mountains and the animals, you know, it's all part of the experience. Yeah. You don't have to say that you like or dislike any of it. You just accept it and you come to love that it's part of your experience. Right. I mean, I look at some of the really hard stuff that I went through yeah. and, you know, I can't say that I wouldn't, that I want to get rid of that either because that's way. the stuff that made me who I am. Well, so exactly. it's it's not about pushing away whatever you have to go through. It's about like, well, that's what I got to go through. Yeah, you need you need those challenges. Yeah, you know, you need you need like the the things to uh, the things that you end up fighting against can define you in a good way as well. That's right. That's right. Yeah, yeah it's like the pushback of the weight machine. Mm-hmm. You get stronger by, you know. I mean, that's I like that thing that quote by Henry Rollins because mm-hmm. <clears throat> I I. I used to be a weightlifter. I mean, I still lift a little bit, but mm-hmm. I mean, I used to really lift weights. And uh, Henry Rollins has that quote, the iron does not lie. Uh-huh. You know, the, the pushing against tells you where you're at. Yeah. You know? Yeah, you need to do something hard every day, I think. You yeah. need to sweat. Yeah. Like, if you if you want to be, like, really, really happy. At least that's the way I see it now. And it's like, And there's always that, like, resistance, like, in the morning before you go out. It's like... Even there's that voice that'll go like, "Hey, so why do you always need to like exercise?" Like, you know, it'll the voice will trick will be tricky too. Like, it'll, yeah. it'll like seem like it's on the side of like, you know, but it's like a lot of it is just because I don't want to spend my the first part of my day thinking. I want right. to do stuff that's right. not thinking. That's good. You yeah. know what I mean? I yeah. want to like get us like I want to listen to a sermon or I want to like, and then run or like, you know, just right. You know, just there's like really obvious ways you can like angle your day towards a real positive vibe. Right. You know, and that first part of the day is so important. Like, do you ever listen to Abraham Hicks? I haven't, but I've heard of yeah. him or. Yeah, well, it's right. a group of people okay. that's spoken usually or always through through. uh somebody named Esther, I think. It's a woman. Okay. So, but Abraham Hicks is like a group of spirits that speak through her. But anyway, she uh, talks about the first part of the day being so important. And if you kind of almost get off the wrong track, like the yeah. momentum of the day yeah. is so important. Like, right, right. And if you get a fear momentum going on, her recommendation is usually uh, just like start again tomorrow. Right. Like don't even try to turn it over. <laughs> right. Know? So the getting the right momentum is really important. My wife and I try to start and you can't, we can't do it every day because when we're traveling, it's not, a, but we try to start every day with a meditation, uh-huh. you know, because it really does just like settle yourself, get focused and then go begin the day. And there's that great quote by Gandhi uh-huh. where, cause he had the same practice and his assistants would say, Oh, we got a really busy day. It's a full day of interviews and meetings. And he'd be like, Oh, I got to meditate a little bit longer then. Yeah. You know, you got to get yourself ready for that day. Yeah. It gives you more time. Yeah. The t- putting time aside gives you more time you and it's the same time. way like working out going to the gym i like to swim yeah like i love swimming and when you <laughs> well and i can't it's hard to find a swimming pool you know yeah. like you do yeah. it when you can find it but you put that time in and you can you feel you know what yeah. what a what a recharge it gives you you know yeah but I, i'm really convinced and i say this from my own just ongoing evolution is like this thing of like disliking things or like feeling any kind of revulsion to things. I catch myself. I'm like, why am I saying I don't like this? What is it that I don't like about it? And Uh I'm like, look at what that is. And then, but absolutely, we are at a time in human history where this idea of hating 
anyone or yeah. hating the other, that that madness has to stop. It has to stop. We have to stop I hating could, other I agree more. other hum- Just stop it. Yeah. You know, just like recognize we're all here together. We're all on the same planet. Yeah. We we are all doing basically the same things and we care about the same things yeah that's been my experience everybody cares about their children everybody cares about getting everybody fed and safe and warm and like and hopefully like a an education you know a little bit better experience you know and we just got to just keep that in the forefront of our minds right you know yeah most people want the same things they just have they might disagree about what's the best way to get the best way to get there but 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 they're doing the best they can and they want the same things that's right you know like yeah i don't even want to bring up the v thing but like even within that whole debate it's like i think both sides are wanting health for everybody sure they just see opposite they see the danger being the most prevalent danger being opposite things sure is, is all but like there's this like there's this push to demonize and it comes from both sides. I'm not even going to like I'm not even picking a side as which is the wrong or which is the right. Both sides are demonizing the other side. Sure. And that's yeah. playing directly into the hand of of like of the enemy, if you ask me, or of the people that would or of the destructive forces that are obviously at work in this world because there's destructive and constructive forces it's like a yin and a yang so like the light and the dark or whatever so to me it's playing directly in the hands of the dark side to create this division and demonize each other when when really ultimately if you analyze it it's just a disagreement as to which way do we get to the healthiest space and we both we all want to be in the healthiest space like clearly right. like right. i don't think anyone's rooting for a bunch of death and destruction of I course think we're not. all right. obviously rooting for how do we be how do we protect our health and we just have a philosophical difference as to the best way of going about that it's all it is right yeah. and one of the one of the good things about the interconnectedness of the world and and because the you know the internet is a double-edged sword too. Right. But the best part of it is the way that we're able to communicate around the world instantaneously. And it's making people realize how connected we are, not just, you know, from culture to culture, but huge, you know, geographical areas that we're connected to, even if we're not right there. So huh. what's happening in the Arctic affects us here in New York City. Right. Or what's happening in the Amazon rainforest affects you know the air quality of everybody around the world you know so those might be places that are far away and maybe you know most people probably won't go to the arctic or the amazon rainforest although i recommend if you can they're incredible places but Mm -hmm. we have to we have to begin to realize how those changes that are happening are affecting all of us and what can we do Mm -hmm. to balance things out so that we all live healthier and uh, more productive lives, and also for children and grandchildren, and you know, seven generations, yeah. as the Native Americans think about it. You know, really think long term like that. We oh, have to. Yeah. We, we have to start doing that. Yeah. That's how they think about it. It was always seven generations. Why seven? It's a sacred number mm-hmm. in in their cosmology, but they just had the wisdom to to think like the decisions we make now will affect seven generations of people Mm. and we don't think like that in a capitalist society where we just think about what can i buy with my next paycheck you know we're not thinking about hmm i wonder what you know if if i do this thing what are the long-term consequences of that right so you have seven billion people on this planet and growing we we need to really start thinking more collectively like that yeah that's true yeah well how do you think we get how do you propose we get there because i think like you know and it's what's going on with like israel right now and palestine and all that it's like just there's you know it's just it just seems like okay here's now a new whole thing of division and anger and then social media and people picking sides and demonizing new but yeah it's not new (laughs) obviously not new but you but it's the it's the newest one everyone's paying attention to right until the next one but what i'm saying is oh there seems to be always this energy of that like you know and it's like so how do we as a collective turn it around and, and become more because there's so much energy in that like in that um 
drama and that conflict there's right. conflict is the seductive energy because it right. taps into people's pain bodies right. Right. and 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 you know not people aren't 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 taking care of themselves enough so so that conflict actually more sort of reflects what's going on in their internal space and right. then they can vent that stuff and and if and it, and it's usually i think i feel like the, all that sort of conflict is like it can they can they can invest in whatever conflict is being presented to them now with the media like right. and and that's playing out we're seeing it over and over again it's like here's the next conflict to like pay attention to and pick right. a side and go on social media and war with each other and it right. like it right. keeps changing but you know so like how do we like get to a place as a collective where we start being more sort of drawn to love and drawn to unity and drawn to these things that heal us and keep us together. I've always found that it's the people in the middle that are doing the work together to hold things together. So like, like you, you, you brought up, it, you, you brought up the Israel Palestine conflict. Mm -hmm. So I've, I've been in Israel and, and I had an incredible experience because I got to work with, really smart progressive israelis and palestinians that mm -hmm. were working together we worked on a record in the west bank mm -hmm. so i saw that there were these people that wanted to live and work together in harmony mm -hmm. and we don't hear about that in the press we don't hear well, about course, that there's yeah, all these exactly really great you know groups of israeli and palestinian you know mothers and and yeah. fathers and they work together and they they have all these you know cultural and community groups and and projects that they work on together what we get is the extreme side of it right. and we get it in this country too and 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 that's you know th that's how the media gets attention and they seduce and people into, into this that, into well, yeah clickbait everywhere and yeah it's about yeah. money yeah. with the news right now. yeah and just yeah. having a story that's controversial to run until uh -huh. we find the next that's a right. chase constant chase yeah, yeah. And, and they cycle out quickly it's and then it's not about news anymore it's just about content Right, right, and right. And views right. And, right. and audience retention and what will keep people coming back. So how do we make love seductive? You stop watching and, and the news. Well, I know I already have. Cause, <laughs> well, but I'm just saying. Although, like, how music. Do we, although music. let's. Yeah, let's, music. But, but let's music is the answer. How do we make now? love <laughs> become the clickbait? Like, <laughs> but we also have like to be. We're bored by love, I guess. You know, We, like, also, we don't want to clickbait <laughs> love unless it's porn, but that's not love. <laughs> we have to be reasonable porn about. Porn is a we, solution, yes. No, I don't think so. We have Bro. to be reasonable about like yeah. like we do need to be aware of what's going on in the world you know we need some news to tell us what's going you know we yeah. need to know that but what we what we really need to do is like just take that individual responsibility to look at what is your what is the role you're playing and mm -hmm. what are you trying to do to make the world better, A better place. I, yeah. I, it, I swear it's totally true every person has something to offer Absolutely. and it's important and they just have to find what that is yeah. and sometimes other people help draw that out of you. Yeah. You know, like working You're with, good at that. You're uh, really good I, at that. It's a little talent I have. I can yeah. pull good performances and get people <laughs> to do this cool thing, you know. But The but, best producers in the world are psychological like that. They make yeah. people feel special. And you've done that with me. I, well, you're an incredible artist. And I knew that before I, I worked with you. I was trying to get you, you to say that yeah. on the camera. <laughs> but what I also oh, said... Is it recording? Wait, are you uh, recording no, but, still, Poppy? Or did you end this episode? I also, <laughs> said, I also said you're a great poet. <laughs> Which is something that, you know, that, I'm getting it. I'm that, but, it. I'm getting but that's it. important, you know, like, like poet, poetry and music yeah. are not necessarily, don't always go together, right. but when they do, it's really powerful, really you know, magical, yeah. but, but it, it really, it's just up to the individual to find what that thing is and give it up to the world. It's, yeah. that's really what you have to do. And, yeah. and, and I'm not saying you shouldn't watch the news because I read the news. I mean, I read it. I don't watch it. I don't yeah. watch television. I just read, you know, and I use my own discerning wisdom to kind of go, okay, mm -hmm. you know, here's probably what's really going on. But, um, so you don't want to be, you know, you don't want to isolate yourself, but, but you just need to be engaged in the world. Mm -hmm. Just really be engaged and do the best work you can do. Mm hmm and know that you're that you're we're all very powerful but we're t we're taught by like yeah. there's a big push that you that you don't mean anything or it doesn't matter right. or shut right. up or I this know. that and the other yeah. and it's like 
I think people don't realize how influential they can be, even if they don't have giant social media followings or whatever, just expressing themselves and not being afraid is like, is huge. Yeah. And I, I really do not believe that anybody should just be thrown out to the curb, you know, like everybody has something to say and something to offer, but it's, it's got to be tempered with kindness and compassion. And you really got to think about what what it is you want to communicate, yeah. you know, with like this extreme division and hatred and yeah. that just, it's got to go away. We really have to work towards that. And the people that, that do a lot of work in that realm are musicians and yeah. artists because they can convey this, you know, they have a way of conveying it in their music and in their, in their writing and in, in the visual art. And, you know, there's incredible, like the visual media right now, you know the filmmaking and Mm. and and even even though i don't watch television there's incredible stories being written you know these series that are now i guess you call it television but Mm -hmm. but uh you know the the programming that's in in some of these um cable and network network series are are really remarkable like the stories they're able to tell well you're a filmmaker as well it's more that I've worked on on uh, the soundtrack side, but okay. as, and and I've helped write some storylines. But so in this blues documentary, can yeah, tell, tell us about that because yeah. you weren't involved in the filmmaking side of that, more the soundtrack. I was involved in the but filmmaking, I, I but felt like you were, but only because it was built around studio sessions. Oh, I but see. It's that kind of filmmaking. Oh, not, I got I'm it. not like you know writing screenplays but hey man it starts there like dave starts grohl's there. been yeah. doing pretty yeah. good with that like you know yeah who yeah. knows it, yeah. it could Son- evolve sonic highways is great that yeah. was a really cool was, series an interesting thing yeah an interesting take yeah for sure well the short story on this documentary it's called the last blues man and right. it's about the last living blues man c Dell davis who was 92 when he finally passed away but he was the same age as muddy waters and bb king and came up in the Mississippi Delta at the same time that those guys did. But they all went on to, you know, they moved to New York, Chicago, became famous. He stayed in the Delta and kept this whole tradition alive. On top of that, he'd had polio at the age of 10 and was trampled in a barroom stampede and like was literally in a wheelchair for 60 years of his life. Wow! But he learned how to play slide guitar with his gnarled hands and became this really incredible slide guitar player who played with Robert Nighthawk and, you know, made some pretty legendary recordings. Did and the gnarled hands have anything to do polio. with his... Uh, yeah, but I yeah. mean, did they have anything to do with the style of, that he eventually... Yes, because because his hands were, were gnarled and he couldn't play fretted guitar. He figured out how to use a butter knife as a slide. Uh-huh. So he invented the butter knife slide technique, which, which, which people copy. Wow. So anyway, he made you know several records and i produced his last three records i co-produced one of them but but uh but i actually financed them because <laughs> because because nobody wanted to pay for those kind of records back then you know <laughs> i mean they're, they're expensive to make and not a lot of people buy them but yeah. they're but it's a documentation of like that original delta style so so you're on the soundtrack. Peter Buck's on the soundtrack. Duff McKagan from Guns N' Roses is Lanigan. on. Lanigan. Lanigan's on. Because we're all people that either played with him or were influenced by that music. Mm-hmm. And so... Um, so what was it, it like working with Sadell? Well, he was kind of... He was like a Buddha kind of figure. You know, he's this big guy in a, in a wheelchair and he didn't talk very much. So this is another example of how he didn't say very much. Kept that energy. But when he did say something you really paid attention to it. like, uh-huh. And so he had this way of kind of pulling everybody together. And everybody that played, it was really cool because it was like, it was a mixture of black and white people all playing together, learning these Delta songs and trying to like reproduce them as authentically as possible with him singing. Uh-huh. And the first record I made with him, he was still playing slide guitar, but the last two records he'd had a stroke and he couldn't, just couldn't play guitar anymore, okay. so he just sang. Right, and um, it's it was like really one of the most profound musical experiences of my life because I realized I'm playing with somebody that's as old as as a great grandparent, and they are the founders of American music as we know it. Mm. Because every form of music has its its roots are in the Delta. Right. So blues begat 
jazz and begat rock and roll and rhythm and blues and country blues and country, country western, uh-huh. hip hop, right. you know. Like you can hear the roots of hip hop with those old blues guys when they would do these kind of rhyming schemes, you yeah. know. And, uh, you know, most of us that worked with him were essentially rock musicians. Although when I would produce the records, I'd bring in jazz guys too, horn players and upright bass players and people like that. And we all learned something from him in our, you know, it was unique to each of us. But I think when the film, the film's going to be going to film festivals this winter and, you know, into next year and hopefully it'll get picked up. But it's just a really beautiful story about how one guy affected all of us, men and women, black and white, young and old. We were all like really touched by him. That's amazing. That kind of goes in line with what we were just saying right before that. Yeah. Like how, yeah. you know, you never know how powerful you are and like, that's right. And where your gifts are going to ultimately come from. And like how, like having like a, a hard situation, like being like, you know, stuck in a wheelchair or whatever can yeah. actually maybe in some kind of way. Yeah. Sort of uh, change the world. Well, or just imbue your gift with even more force, you yeah. know, if you don't yeah. let it defeat you. Yeah. Yeah, this is a guy that at the you know, he was born in 1926. Uh-huh. So he he's he's a handicapped young black man growing up mm. in an extremely racist segregated south, right. you know? But he he just figured out like, well, I can play guitar and I can sing and I yeah. can I can and I'm good at it. And he forged this life for himself. Yeah. And it was not any, I mean, really, of all the people I met, including Mark Lanigan, that, I mean, this guy's the toughest guy <laughs> I've ever met. What, and made, what, what was he like? What made him so tough? Like, what do you mean? Just literally? like everything. I mean, there's just so many stories of what happened to him. Right. You know, but just, you know, being. That it didn't defeat him? No, it didn't defeat him. It right. made him stronger. You right. Know? Like having polio at such a young age and then, you know, being trampled in a stampede in a bar, you know, like a gambling room. Yeah. Somebody pulled a gun and fired fired a couple shots and the place stampeded and knocked him off the stage and trampled him, broke his legs so badly that then he was in a wheelchair from like 1957 on. From the, from the stampede? Yeah, he was in a wheelchair from like 1957. Oh, I, I into, assumed it was from the polio. No, he, could, he, he was on crutches for a while with, with polio, but then he was in a wheelchair from 1957 until he passed away in 2017. It's like 60 years. Wow. And, uh, and just, you know, a hard life, you know, just eking out. How did you meet him? I was introduced to him by another drummer and percussionist who introduced me to him in, uh, I think, two, the year 2000. Yeah. A guy that I'd gone to Cuba with, when we came back, he said, you got to meet this this old blues guy that I know. Was he like a mentor figure? Well, I can't say mentor because, you know, he, he was not... like. I'm not sure he remembered my name most of the time. I mean, to be quite honest. Doesn't mean he's not a mentor, though, (laughs) to to be be honest. Like, that's another form of mentorship. Yeah, like, Like, just like, He mentored me by his example. (laughs) Right. But, and I, you know, like, I'm the guy, like, like, (laughs) like. This guy every day come in here. Yeah, like, I'm I'm paying, I was paying for the (laughs) albums and, you know, like, like funding the whole thing. But he, you know, I think by the end he recognized my face maybe, but, but, um. But all these people that played with him were heavily, heavily affected by it. But to me, it was just one more lesson in in what I've learned about, at least this country anyway, is that everything is so connected and you can't Mm -hmm. isolate it and say, no, that music is only from here or it's only, it's like, no, it all comes from like this mother source that we all have benefited from that, you know, and, and the, this was the last living generation that you know, carried over into this lifetime right? where I was able to like actually touch it and play with it, you know? That's amazing, man. Your path and your story is incredible, dude. It really is. We've like led Just a... lucky. <laughs> nah, man. Yeah, it's, but, yeah, I mean, I'm, you know, I'm sure you're highly favored and blessed and all that, but like there's also like so much, uh, so much you put into your life and you honor life in such a profound way that, that is unusual and inspirational. Where do you think that comes from? Like, what? Well, like, why do you think you honor life the way you honor life? I don't know. I feel like 
we were talking about this. I feel like kind of an old soul, but then I also try to stay youthful. You're you know? very, you're very, you, you have a very <laughs> both young and old energy. You definitely have a very youthful spirit. I try to keep it, keep it up, you know, yeah. keep, just like be playful in life and, and enjoy yeah. it and have, have yeah. fun with it. Also, you know, part of it is like you, you get an opportunity, seize the opportunity. Yeah. I, I got kind of offered like, you want to go to the Amazon and, I'm like, yes, I'll sit. I'm like Jim Carrey in the movie. Yes, man. You know, yeah, like, that's a good one. Yes, I'll do that. Right. Yes, I will do that. Say yes. Yeah. more than You, you want to come no. out to Nashville and just jam? We'll see. Yes, I'll come to Nashville. And yeah. like, let's just say yes. Yes, right. I'll try it. I'll do it. You know, yeah. I mean, be careful in what you say yes to. <laughs> <laughs> I got some crack cocaine. Yes. <laughs> no, that's one you should no, say, say no, no to. Say no yeah. to something. Well, I'm glad yeah. I said yes when they when uh, Peter asked me to uh, join a band with you guys, man. Because yeah, uh, yeah, it's it's fun. It's so fun, dude. And the record we made is really like special. Can you man. say when it's coming out, or you're not yeah, on Thirty Tigers? Yeah, Thirty no, Tigers. When? When? Uh, I think yeah. early next year, because oh, everything okay. is kind of six months out. You know, it takes six months just to make vinyl right now. So because uh, because of the backlog, yeah, so. uh, I know it's like that with everything. Right. But um, I think we're going to play some shows before then, though. Although yeah. not announced yet. I'm going to film. And we're getting it ready to be mastered. We just finished. Yep. We finished yep. the mixes at Flux, New York City. Shout what a great, Flux. great Me and studio. Barrett and uh, Daniel. Da- Daniel Sanyit. What a great oh, engineer. He's and, such a cool dude. Flux NYC. Shout out. Yep. Shout out, Daniel. Yep. About yeah. your project, a question for you. When he sent back his first take on lyrics for the first song, what was your initial reaction? Well, right away, I, I paid him to ask that question. <laughs> <laughs> I said, I'll give you 20 well, no, bucks. Do, I get, was it like, do I get paid for did, the response? Did you, to when you were talking to Peter and Rich, we're like, let's see what this guy gives back before we give him the gig, or was it, you know? Well, like, I mean, like anything, you're always like, you know, with music, it's like, well, let's see what it sounds like, you know, yeah. like we didn't, when we went to Nashville to record the basic, you know, the first guitar tracks, we didn't know what it was going to sound like until it was recorded, you right, know, but right. it turned out like sounds pretty good. So we got his first, he worked fast. I mean, within a couple of days, you must've sent us three songs, mm-hmm. you know, certainly within a week we had like four or five songs. Right. And the, the, I remember Rich texting me or maybe he called me and, and said, uh, Man, these are really good melodies and really good lyrics. And I said, I know. And that is not an easy combination to find, you know, like great poetry and great melody and great sounding voice, you know. I mean, there's all this stuff about, you know, it's all it's like the whole combination of the chemistry together makes this thing happen yeah you yeah, know? No. we yeah. both watched the documentary on when velvet revolver were looking for the lead singer and that oh right i'll think right you guys really just had if they made that documentary it would just be him in the in the running kind of and getting it yeah yeah we didn't there this there were no other nobody else recorded anything yeah. there wasn't any other singer you sure. know so so it was like we just got those and we we're like well that's it you know, it's pretty obvious right away. So that's cool, man. What and what, you, you were about to say something about chemistry? I don't know. Well, I was just saying that thing about like it's a thing I've noticed with bands because I've been in several in my life, but most of them were like really early on. And so what you you see how those four or five actually every band I've been in has been four people those four people create this certain chemistry uh-huh. and and then you know you you get into another band and you realize oh well i bring this thing that i do but it's different with this combination yeah. it just pulls something different out of you absolutely so it like you're not always the same you don't step in the same river twice as they say well yeah and just like a rain a rainforest can have the melody and the song already within it the rain right right i mean i right. feel like this project you know had yeah there's so many there's so much melodic information going on because you also make instrumental records which yeah. are really yeah. great and like you have a really strong sort of melodic gift um <clears throat> which you express in all kinds of ways and you express it in this band and then you got rich who as well has like really right. really strong melodic gift and so does peter buck obviously right 
you know so and um yeah and i feel like i do as well like, oh yeah I, so, so yeah like, so all of us together it's a, it's a very melodic band which i which i'm very excited about melody is such an interesting melody is king it's, it's such an interesting concept just in itself because right because it, it where does it come <clears throat> from yeah and and when you listen to uh pop music like from like from the 60s, you know, because that's mm-hmm. that I was a kid. The good shit. I was a kid in the late 60s. Yeah. <clears throat> I was born in 67, right? So everything that I heard on the radio as a kid was from the 60s and early 70s, which uh-huh. is kind of the classic pop era. Yeah. You know, this you know, this is the era of Motown and Stax Records and Burt Bacharach and those melodies were yeah. like very sophisticated and long and mm-hmm. they went a long time before they repeated themselves. Yeah. And uh, I noticed this also when I worked in Brazil. The Brazilians are really into melody. And mm-hmm. so those Brazilian singers have these beautiful, long melodies that, you know, go. You can mention you got a Grammy from the Brazil record. <clears throat> oh, that's right. Yeah, well, I did. I won a, a Latin Grammy for a Brazilian. <laughs> I produced a <laughs> Brazilian. On top of everything we discussed, <laughs> we have a Grammy. Uh, Grammy winner. award winner. <laughs> but that was, a, that was an unexpected win, I'll say that, because it's you never know how those things are going to happen. But what you do do is you make the best record you can possibly make. Yeah. And then you just see what happens. Like what we did. Like that. What are we wearing? To <laughs> I don't know, but we, it's all about Next the, it's all about the right? pocket it's kerchief. It's all about the kerchief. Like with our mixing <laughs> philosophy, we decided we want to keep the suits elegant and classic. Like, you know, some Giorgio Armani type of like, I want to bring the yeah. ascot back. The black suits, but <laughs> but in terms of our production, we have some fancy ascots and we got some scarves. That's and right. Some kerchiefs. That's and right. So, you know, the yeah. matching socks that might have some Smurfs on them or whatever. Like we get a little weird and freaky in subtle ways, but we keep it classic. Always keep it cla- Always classic. Keep it. Yeah. Yeah, we kept it classic. But as far as melody goes, those those beautiful melodies from that early pop era i mean you just kind of can't beat it all you can do is try to emulate it as closely as like pay honor to it because yeah those were real master songwriters who are your what are your like what would you say is your like top five ever bands wow i know that's a hard one but can i'm gonna mix genres here. yeah go for it well and and also by the way this is just right now it's not like yeah for yeah. all time and you said this and it stands <laughs> right, right right it's like that that question that he'll have a different answer every day but what's the answer today well i would say probably the second miles davis quintet with herbie hancock and nice. wayne shorter and and um you know tony williams and ron carter i mean that's just like an incredible incredible band um and i would also say led zeppelin mm-hmm. and I think the original Elton John band is wow. just incredible. You know, yeah. Nigel Olsen on the drums, D. Murray bass, Davy Johnstone on guitar. Who played uh, piano in that band? Hmm. <laughs> <I'm just kidding>. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that, but that, that I was going to say that that album, Goodbye Yellow Brick Road. Um, that's another one of those albums where they wrote the songs. Elton would take Bernie Toppin's lyrics mm. that morning at breakfast, yeah. write the song, they'd record it that afternoon. Yeah, sometimes speed is just sometimes yeah. great for projects. Exactly. You know, not not yeah. overthink. Like, yep. It's it's a it's a real balance. Yeah. Because you can really go too far in thinking. You can also undercook stuff. You yeah. can. Yeah. It's also possible. Sure. Totally. If yeah. yeah. It's all about the effort. Yeah. You know, effort can be concentrated and short or it can be long and sustained. Whatever the effort, it <clears throat> needs to sound effortless. I would also say um, the Bruce Springsteen and the E Street Band. Uh-huh. I saw them on that Born in the USA 1984. Yeah. I was Love like that a sophomore in high school or whatever. That show and that band. At that time. At that time, that was incredible. Biggest never band in the world. Too. Yeah. Like and he they, was huge. And four and a half hour shows. I mean, just yeah. like they, they, it was incredible. That energy. So how many is that? So that's Miles. I think that's four. Zeppelin, Bruce Springsteen. Uh, I Elton mean, John. Elton John, Soundgarden. Yeah. That Soundgarden. What a cool list, dude. It's pretty. Yeah, but and uh, it'll change tomorrow. Of course. But, yeah, but yeah. I'd say like, but those are pretty foundational, right there. Yeah. Yeah. What about Soundgarden? Man, I just so much? 
because I think Kim Thiles' guitar playing is so complete is genius. He's a Chris actual is, genius guitar player, and Chris is singing, and, and Matt Cameron's drumming, and Ben Shepard's bass. Yeah, that quartet is that is a great. That, band. I think that's the greatest band to ever come out of Seattle. Wow. I do. Wow. I think so. I that's think so. amazing. Because Jimmy Hendrix is from. I mean, even though he's yeah. from Seattle, his band was British. Right. So, but I think as far as like rock band. Soundgarden. That's incredible. That quartet. Yeah. There, there just isn't anything that comes close to it. That's wild. And you, and, and, and I'm and I'm friends with Kim too, and he's actually played on a, on a, two of my solo records. Shout out Kim. Shout out to Kim. We would love to have you on the podcast, bro. Uh, oh man, Anytime. he's he's an incredible conversation. That yeah. guy. Yeah. Yeah. But um, what about Nirvana though? Well, I like Nirvana too. I'm not saying that they're yeah. they're not a great band. No, I, and I'm not. Yeah, I'm yeah. Not, that's not a pushback against like oh comparing them to Soundgarden, but just like did you get to ever hang out with Kurt? I didn't. No, not Kurt. And and I was never really friends with them. Although later, I was I, a huge fan of his. Later, I became friends with uh, with uh, Chris, Chris 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 Novoselic and yeah. uh, Dave. I will say this: When I was playing in Skinyard with with uh, Jack and Dino, we were playing a club in San Francisco called the I Beam. Mm-hmm. Yeah. In uh, I think it was 1990, and it might have been 89, late 89, early 90. And we got there a day early, and Jack had gotten a message from Kurt Cobain and Chris saying, "Like, hey, we're going to this show uh, tonight at the I Beam." our night off mm-hmm. and it, it was a band called scream which was dave Grohl's punk rock band oh, right. they said we're checking out this drummer so we go and we watch scream play with dave Grohl playing drums and and you know the i-beam was a pretty big club but it was pretty empty i mean there wasn't that many people there That's to see awesome. <laughs> and but but me and jack and Kurt Cobain and Chris Novoselic were just standing there watching. Are you kidding? No, I'm not. And I leaned over, I leaned over to Chris and I said, I literally said, I think you better get that guy in your band before somebody else does. Wow. And Chris Chris just goes, yeah, I think we've already decided on that. So I don't know if that was the first time they'd ever seen him, but I I was with them when they were checking him out. Barrett made the call and that's why. Yeah, Yeah. I made the call. I mean, mean, but that's just like so wild too because you're like right there at something historical. Like it it turns out to be like totally historical. Like even like, like okay, in our band, like just getting invited into to this band, and then all of a sudden you bring up the idea of going to Jack and Dino Studio where we did some rough mixes right. and all that. Right, exactly. Like for me, that's a, incredible because yeah. like yeah. Bleach was such a huge pivotal album for me, and so Jack right. looms large as this like, you know, this historical figure, and so just to be able to like uh, spend a week in that studio and just in that energy and. Um, I don't know. It's cool. It's 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 yeah. cool to be, you know, on the periphery of history. Yeah, Jack was my first real mentor. Right. You know, and he still is a really good friend of mine. I mean, I just mixed my new solo album with him. You know, I still right. work with him all the time. Yeah. And um and then Peter Buck was was my my second big mentor. You What'd know? you learn from Jack? <clears throat> Jack's whole thing, from a production standpoint, was capture the human performance. That's mm-hmm. the most important thing. Like get the best performance out of the band or the or the individual musician and um, have the good sense to know when you've bottled the lightning, when you got it. Huh. Don't keep working it until it's dead. Like know when that's it. That's the take. Yeah. You can feel it. It gives you goosebumps. And right. you intuitively, spiritually know that was the take. Yeah. That's the thing that can't... Listen, you have to listen to that gut yeah. instinct. You have to yeah. tune that gut instinct in yeah. and listen to it and don't second guess it and just keep keep it moving. Yeah. And Jack also is really... He's really about like, you know, keep your word, do good work, be, be a good, honest person, mm-hmm. keep your word, do what you say you're going to do. Yeah. He's really all about that. That's why people love him and still have him, you know, they go to him. It's like a pilgrimage to have him make make your record. You I know? totally felt like it was a pilgrimage <clears throat> yeah. when I went to Seattle. It was the first trip I took after this whole. I didn't realize first, that's first, where you went. First plane ride I went on 
from this whole coast. Oh, that's right. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Yeah, we went there to. And it to, felt like a pilgrimage. Well, I I, 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 I told Ehud to come. I, I was like, where you went. we could have had Jack studio. on the podcast. Yeah, I mean, no, yeah, now yeah. you tell me. Oh no, I told bro, <laughs> Poppy, come on. Now he tells me it was <laughs> Jack's too. Now together. you're creating division. Now we're gonna go to war because <laughs> oh, I did yeah, tell you. Yeah. I was telling you to come out there. I always invite you out there or wherever. But I mean, what did you learn from Peter? Well, Peter gave me a lot of just like music business advice stuff, you know, yeah. like, like just stuff like don't sell your publishing, you mm -hmm. know, like always like try to own your masters, you yeah. know, right from the beginning. Yeah. Um, also, you know, Peter's very much about go for the performance, mm -hmm. you know, I think. And don't um, overthink it. Yeah. Like, like uh, that. And th this came out, you know, when they did their those documentaries, um, their biggest song, Losing My Religion, you know, that's the demo, you right. know, like they did the demo and then tried to redo it and make it better. But the yeah. demo is still the and so they just used they built off of that because yeah. he, he was like, that's the take. Mm -hmm. It's not going to get better than that. Yeah. You know, there's other stories about that, too. Like, I think it's it's that police song. um, Every little thing she does is magic. Mm -hmm. That was a demo that they tried to record over and over and try to, mm -hmm. and they couldn't. So they just used the demo. So like Peter was all about the like, same thing as Jack, you mm -hmm. know, like pay attention to when you capture the magic and that's it. Like yeah. it could be a live, maybe only used like four tracks, but if that's it, that's, that's the magic take. Yeah. Peaches on that one, her hit, <clears throat> the F the pain away. Right. That's that's a, a, that's a soundtrack. I mean, that's a sound, sound check. check. Sound check. It's right. A sound check. So she had the good intuitive sense to say, like, that's the take. Yeah, that's and it's it. a huge hit. It sounds amazing. I never right. thought of it as a sound check. Thing. You, like right. you don't you don't know that when you're listening back to things. You know, you just accept it for what it is. Right. But it's hard to get out of your own way in those in those cases. I yeah. think. You know. Yeah, that's the part you can't teach anybody. You yeah. just have to like. You just develop it over time. Mm -hmm. It's like faith over fear. And also that, I mean, this is kind of a, just something I learned through my own experiences, both good and bad, but you just look after your bandmates, yeah. you know, like take care of everybody, make sure everybody's like healthy, and happy. keep people safe, happy, and, and do good work. You know, the greatest quote of all time, is what? is from patty smith what is it and uh it's um don't think about making a bunch of money or being famous just do good work keep your name clean and over time your name becomes its own currency huh. that i've always thought that was a great quote because yeah. he's right like like just do your best artistic work don't worry about the trappings of that but just keep it keep your name clean your name becomes its own currency Right. And then Kim, and I'm just realizing these are both New York legends. And then Kim Gordon from Sonic Youth. Yeah. And both of these, these women I've played with shows with, like I've played Patti Smith, you know, on stage with her and the Screaming Trees played shows with Sonic Youth. And uh, Kim Gordon said, um, I want to get this exactly right. Uh, um, people pay money to watch other people believe in themselves. Wow. Isn't that a good one? That's a really good one. Yeah. When when you believe in yourself and you get up there and you do it, that's what people want to see. They want to see you believe in yourself. Yeah. I like that one way better because keep your name clean is so loaded. <clears throat> well, I think it's she... Like, it's also no. because, you know, because like also though, because if you put yourself out there, your name is going to get thrown through them like of so the course keep your name yeah. clean to me like has a spirit of fear to it especially like and it's also good to, though too it's like depending on how you mean it but i'm just saying how that one strikes me i know how she meant it though yeah have you ever made a record that you didn't really believe in well that too it's like yes and no i mean you know like the thing is is my mind will always attack things like there's also like you have to like that reminds me of good, like again why I don't like that is because it's like um, perfect perfection gets in the way of good or good. What's that? Oh right, like, right. You know what I mean? Like like I don't like I think people are gonna like 
have self doubt about anything they put a lot of lo- heart and soul and love into. And right. Picasso says, "Never sell yourself anything," and like or something like that. But there's going to be whenever you do something with a, a creative effort, there's going to be a side of you that doubts it, and part of you is going to have to overcome that to get it out there. Because otherwise, a lot of times people will just stop themselves from ever putting anything out because it's never good enough. Right. Right. You know what I mean? And again, that's why that that's why that one doesn't inspire me as much because in a way I feel like it's more important to just like engineer risk into your life and put things out there and 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 overcome the voices of doubt that that will ultimately crop up in your head so in a way I would say keep your name dirty <laughs> <laughs> but everything else I agree it's, you know uh, it's similar we had a comedian Sherrod Small <laughs> yeah. who Joe asked him about going on stage for the first time and he said yeah. nobody wants to see somebody try right oh uh, right on stage you can't just try you gotta you gotta, you gotta do, be you all gotta, in yeah, that's right yeah, you gotta yeah, believe yeah. in yourself and you gotta commit to it but but in defense of what Patty's saying I think she's just saying like be an authentic artist right that's, that's what it is I mean okay yeah like every artist makes mistakes I mean right. I, I, I'm proud of every record I've worked on some are much better than others there's a right. few I'm like ah, that was maybe a wrong turn there maybe I should have yeah but I learned from the wrong turn you know right yeah, that's cool. You no, know, I, that's what yeah, I mean. Like, yeah. yeah, there's ways to interpret it, and it could be yeah. interpreted a million ways. But the Kim Gordon one is like, say that one again. People pay money to watch people believe in themselves. Yeah, that's what buying a ticket is. You yeah, buy the ticket pay to money to watch watching people to believe in themselves. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. it's yeah. like yeah, you might as well believe in yourself. Yeah, and 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 overcome those voices of doubt and just like full like. You know, just confidently believe in yourself. Do things. Yeah, you yeah. Know. Both and both of those quotes are by women that just did remarkable musical things mm-hmm. in bands and in their individual yeah. example. You know, and both written books and stuff. Too. That's right. Multiple. Right. Multiple. Yeah. Yeah. Patty, yeah, yeah. I just I read Patty's book, The Year of the Monkey. Uh, just. A few months ago, it was an incredible book. <laughs> what is that book? Yeah, he's got he it. just sent it to me. Oh, yeah, you got it. Yeah, it's been great. Dying to say it. I, <laughs> no, as I soon as he brought up he Patty brought Smith, I, I knew exactly no, that you were going to say cause, it. Because he texted me a picture it. of Patty that like, signed it. I love you, Ahu. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I didn't read it. I just got it in the mail. Yeah. <laughs> What's that one about? It's, I mean, it's about a year of her life, you oh, know, okay. just kind of you know, like just observations on the world. You know, it's just because she she can just put words together, yeah, and the words are just amazing. It's like the, the discipline of writing, it's she, she, exactly she does that, yeah. and it's really yeah. inspiring. And it's uh, it's like she could write it. She could just write about anything. But how the, do you get your discipline to write your books? Uh, just like any other discipline it's like you getting up and running and doing your yoga yeah you know i i i mean i haven't been able to write every day of my life but i put aside the time and i sit there and i write yeah i work on it but how do you put them together and get them ready for publication like well, that seems another level of discipline too well there's that saint nabokov said there's no such thing as writing it's all editing and right. he's right yeah. it's just you know, you, you put the words down on paper or on your computer screen or whatever, yeah. and then you just refine and refine and refine. You spend way more time editing than writing. Yeah. So it's just getting, putting the right combination together and trying to get the, just exactly what you want to say. Yeah. It's just time and discipline is, is. Al- is always what Everything. it is. Yeah. Well, dude, this has been an amazing podcast, man. You it's kind of like the conversations we have in the studio. Yeah. Just like with a microphone in front of us. <laughs> field yeah. field recorder. Yeah. We, yeah. We yeah. Field field recorder. Field exactly. Now yeah. we're field recording yeah. you. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's like if you stare into the abyss long enough, the abyss stares back at you. That's Nietzsche. the abyss. <laughs> yeah. That's Nietzsche. That's yep. the abyss staring right back at you. That's it. We we this has been wonderful to capture your spirit in this way. Yeah, man. it's really cool. I, yeah. I I didn't know the history that this was the great jazz club mm-hmm. where Cafe Bohemian. A, a, a Hood told me the Charlie all, Parker. Yeah, right here. Yeah, and Miles. So, and Miles. 19, yeah. 1956. Miles and, played. A and Art Blakey, one of the greatest drummers of all time, heavily influenced John Bonham, by the way. Oh yeah. Yeah, he loved Art Blakey. Yeah. 
Well, man. All we, right. We forgot just quick not to go longer. Um, you were also in Walking Papers with Duff McKagan. Yeah, Duff's that, an that old. We, he's an old friend of mine. That yeah, that was really. The most recent band yep. supergroup, I guess you joined. I don't know if it's. I mean, me and Duff have known each other since the '90s. He's another Seattle bro, and he's such a great guy. I love Duff. Um, just smart, funny, and extremely knowledgeable about music, mm-hmm. and happens to be a founding member of Guns N' Roses. But he's just he's a great dude to play with. Great, great rhythm section. Me on drums and him on bass was that was a good one. Um, Who's in that band? Walking. Pitbull. It was uh, it was Jeff Angel. Jeff Angel on vocals and guitar, and Ben Benjamin and- Anderson on keyboards. It was a, another quartet. Oh, cool. Just a cool bluesy. Did you guys go tour and stuff. Yeah, we made a couple albums. We toured oh. multiple tours of Europe and North America, and they're still gone. But you know, I I left the band a few years ago, right around the same time Duff did. Duff Duff was rejoining Guns N' Roses to do their big, you know, reunion tour, which he's still doing. And um and I just kinda wanted to do other stuff. Cool, man. Yeah. Well, we're gonna see y'all out on the road probably hopefully soon. I think so. Let's let's make that happen. Name to be determined can't be announced. We've already next year. We named ourselves, yeah, album next year. Shows before the end of this year. Yeah. Yeah, man. And Barrett's books on Amazon. Uh, Amazon, Bar- media, Barnes and Noble. Barrett Martin official. Right? Bar- yep, Barrett Martin official. Yeah. Yep. All right, everybody. Well, thank you, Barrett. Dude, what a great thank podcast. You. Thank you. That was for, a good one. Thanks for everything, man. <laughs> I appreciate Joe. you. Good one, Ehud. You're looking good, bro. Oh, I had one more question. Oh, God. Come on, <laughs> Did you dude. get to see Mother Love Bone live? <laughs> never saw Mother oh, Love Bone. never saw Mother Love Bone. So I, the answer is no, so we can end uh, it there. This but guy, but this guy. I saw the first. <laughs> Seattle, early in the 80s. I got to right, know if you right, saw right, Mother right. Love Bone. I saw, right. the second, I saw the second Mud Honey show. All right. And I'm I saw, not a big fan And I saw the first. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and because you were close to McCready, Pearl yeah. Jam changed a million drummers. Did you ever get the call to like oh, yeah. be the he, Pearl Jam drummer? Like, what's no, up with okay. that? No, no, wow. never, yeah. never got that call. Those huh? were my two questions that I was curious. I about. prefer, I prefer being the lone wolf drummer, and I just play with people that that I choose to. I've, I've never, uh, I've never gotten an audition, and I've never. Oh, I guess the Screaming Trees was, but. I just yeah. like to play with people that that either choose me to play with them or I find the right yeah, combination. It goes but with your name, Barrett. What the name, the meaning of the name is, right? That's right. Or highway guy, highway man. The highway, highway, highway man. the highway man with a yeah. with a drum on his back. <laughs> <laughs> right. I'm done with questions. Sorry about that. Oh, Thank thanks. you, everyone. All right, now we're now, <laughs> now we're, we're done. Now, now we're, we're done. done. All right, thanks, man. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Oh, See follow, you. subscribe, support. Oh yeah, us on support Patreon. us on Patreon. If you made it this far, thank you. You did because this has been a good podcast. All right, everybody, bye. bye. Hi, this is Joseph Arthur. Thanks for checking out Come to Where I'm From. Please support us on Patreon, patreon.com slash come to where I'm from. We are an independent podcast, and any contributions you can make are greatly appreciated.